outside. I think I've got a travel move. international. Oh, non cold water room. Yeah. Yeah. 16 days inside, so please see me and yeah. did that. And then the, the Gulf Coast Ocean Power Strike down to the Phillips Island in Melbourne. And I've traveled some, uh, I mean, I have traveled, but not every So I flew back to Melbourne, flew to Brisbane, and then did the Gold Coast. That was my second trip. Everybody present? Everybody present, just so you know. Microphone is on. We didn't get Darwin or But we're not Adam. broadcasting and recording at the moment. Anyway, if I had so if anybody's out there, they're, you know. I've been thinking about this for a long, long time. Right, right. But I get to speak on that just to put my, I'm putting up staking my flag. <laughs> Scooters versus Starbucks versus Dutch Brothers versus. You're talking to the wrong. <laughs> That's a coffee connoisseur, then. She grinds her own. Yeah. Well, interestingly, we just got our Costco flyer in the mail. Five and a half dollars off of Starbucks, two and a half pound bag. So going like, what in the world could it cost? Hmm. Costco's taking five and a half bucks off. I'll drip some caramel on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go by that clock instead of apple time tonight because it's a whole lot easier. It's not apple time. It's, what is it, city time? It's just <laughs> apple time. I don't want to. <laughs> that clock in my office like that. I'm like, I won't bother changing it because now it's right. <laughs> Did you see that um, when the... Uh, Junior ROTC up at the school. They invited me over to put some things. I said, How come there's not a 24 hour clock in this place? I went, Well, we haven't thought about that yet. I said, you know, Military time, ROTC time. Yeah. Got to have a 24 hour clock. So I went on Amazon. I just bought myself. I took it over there. So anytime I see any of those ROTC cadets, I said, What's the time? <laughs> like, 1800 to. 1640. <laughs> Very good. I think about that. <laughs> okay. Rotsy time, 1800. <laughs> <laughs> and we are opening our planning workshop. This is Tuesday, April 19th, 2024. 
time stamps of the secretary is six o'clock, and we want to go ahead and get underway. Uh, this is a workshop. Uh, we will have discussions on topics related to bond projects, camp improvement projects, funding strategies, and general discussion on the items that are presented before us. And while the agenda doesn't say so, uh, an individual has requested to address us uh, with assistance comments. I will call on that person, uh, Patricia Ebert. Yes. Patricia Ebert, 115 South Greenstone, 75116. So tonight I'm asking for a little money. I'm putting my flag in the state so before the budget cycle really, really <laughs> starts. I'm asking for another code officer now to be hired instead of waiting until the next year's budget. I think that uh, we've found some creative funding strategies up here where you take earn interest money and then also partnering with the DCEDC. Since the city manager has restructured the code enforcement department, I have seen a lot of code enforcement officers out and about. I'm seeing the results in uh, clicks, C click fix, but those are just responding to complaints. I think we need a full-time code enforcement officer that travels throughout the city and looks for existing violations, and there are plenty of them, commercially and residential. Residential, dead trees in yards front and back, lots of them. Cars parked in yards, dilapidated fences, open storage, high weeds, litter, commercial, litter on the parking lots, signs for businesses long gone. Pass it tonight, Main Street, Animal Care Center, been closed for two years. Big blue sign on the parking lot, big blue sign, still there. Light bus, feathered down on Main Street, been closed for two years. The, light, the sign is still on the sign board by the uh, do-it-yourself uh, dog wash. Those are just two of the many, many, many businesses that have signs still there. They've long shut their doors. And then windows and doors of businesses covered with signs and posters that are beyond the limit allowed by our ordinances. And recently, one of the businesses on Main Street put up a big wooden wall in front of their huge plate glass window. Thank you. Okay. All right, city manager, uh, we're turning over the information to you in terms of you want to turn it over to someone else to begin the workshop tonight. Yeah, um, I want to compliment our finance department. <clears throat> oh, Richard Jackson, excuse me. And specifically, Jennifer has been putting a lot into this. <clears throat> the one thing, oh, excuse me, the one thing I would ask you to kind of keep in mind tonight is since we have the facility needs update coming, as well as the operational analysis for police and fire. <clears throat> What we're really going to be asking you tonight is to look at this list and help us prioritize for the 2025 budget. Uh, and then we'll be inviting our new council after the elections uh, this fall to come back with, uh, once we have the results of those studies, and help us do this in a longer term strategy, like a 15 year strategy, so that we can really plan for it and everything. But with that, Jennifer, please take it away. We're all excited. <laughs> Yay! Hip, hip. Hooray! <laughs> I'll have to check in with you every now and then and see how we're still awake after these carbs. So, so um, we, we only have like 190 of these things. Okay, yes. <laughs> so before we kind of get started into everything, well, I know. Let me, let me tell you how the Army does it. Okay? You put this up on a wall and throw darts at it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you prioritize 190 projects. Well, that'll certainly be faster. <laughs> but I'm sorry, we're all fresh adults. So uh, let me give you some a little bit of housekeeping, so because I know you like to kind of browse through what's in front of you. So you each have a copy of the slides, so you have that in front of you. Um, I have some loose pieces of paper if they got removed um, for any note taking that you might have um, as we go along. Um, each of the each of you have a copy of the list that we provided. It is front and back, so I could try to save a few trees. Um, so um, actually, it opens up to the right because the, the, the printer stapled the, the staple on the right. So just be aware of that. Um, so how this is sorted, because I'm going to be going through this, is by priority. 
So we went through the exercise with staff. They, they uh, had to provide me what is their top priorities, like between one and five, um, and rate what's the highest priority and what can be pushed out at the year. So this is actually from year one through year five. And so we're really only focusing on priority number ones, okay? Um, and it's also sorted by department. So it's sorted by priority, and then it's sorted by department, and then sorted by project type. So it's going to go right along with the presentation, and we're going to walk through these. Now, it's not going to have probably as much detail as y'all might need, but there's only so much you can fit on a piece of paper. So I will definitely uh, email you all the spreadsheet, too, and then you can sort and play around and see you know, different things and what that cost might be. So. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go along, but there will be specific times that um, we'll open the floor up for specific discussion before we move on. So, sound good? All right. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, so, our objectives tonight: we're going to uh, go over the priorities in the project as uh, identified by staff. We're actually going to talk through some funding strategies that we've um, identified at this point in time. We're going to go through another priority exercise and discussion with you all at the end after we kind of talk through some of these things. And then our goal tonight is um, to receive clear direction from you all on some of these items, what we need to put in our budget, as well as um, if there's any funding uh, consensus, then you know, we, we kind of know how to move forward with some things. But as a, a city manager, Finch did say that you know we still have some other things coming down the line with the facility assessments, and we'll be coming back to, to kind of bring those to you. So we need to be flexible. All right, so without further ado, we're gonna do a little kind of uh, icebreaker type exercise here, if you don't mind. So I like these little poll, live poll things. So if you wanna get your phone out, and you can either use the QR code or if you'd like to type it in, we are gonna go do a ranking exercise. And it should tell you when you get there. Did everybody get it? Welcome, okay, to, welcome to Jennifer O'Tay. Yes. So here it is. And y'all let me know when it's there. Because I haven't activated it yet. So okay. it'll, it'll populate when I activate it. Right. So I want to make sure everybody's there first. All good? Yeah. All right. Let's go back to you. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> Stay put. Stay put. So I'm activating it. It should populate. And I'm going to present because what we're going to do is it's going to be a live update. So what this is is a ranking exercise. There is a list of different project types. The question is, what type of project is most important to the community, in your opinion? It has a variety of different project types, and you're going to rank them. And it's really hard to do, I know, especially force ranking where you have to pick a number one and pick a number two. But at least... Um, we'll kind of see a consensus based on your input of what you think, what project type is most important. Does that make sense? How many? There are. Yeah, I mean, but how many, what's, what's our ranking, one through five or one? Or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are nine different ones. I know, but how do we prioritize one, one or one you, one, you, you one, put five? them in order of priority. All nine. All night. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm sitting there Because all of these are different projects that we have on our list, and they can all fit in these different categories, so it kind of helps us also to see what is most important to community. So when we kind of narrow down the projects that we have provided to you, we'll be able to pinpoint, hey, these are more public safety projects. Those are top priority to the community, and we kind of need to focus on those, or playgrounds, or, you know. Oh, so it doesn't give a number, it just gives a direction. Yes, yeah, so you kind of have to drag up and down. And it should update live once you start doing that and you submit. Drag up and down. You can kind of see it changing live here. So far, first place is public safety. Make sense? That would be traffic-related 
you know, streets, park security, cameras, things like that. Facility expansion enhancements, that would be, you know, if you're making enhancements or expansions to current facilities, like increasing the rec center or doing something to the senior center, things like that. Utility infrastructure, that's your water, wastewater, uh, drainage. <coughs> Beautification and aesthetics, plantings, trees, lighting. What's that? Gotta settle for bronze. Yes. Uh, <coughs> energy efficient, you know, LED lighting, trains, you know, changing out that kind of lighting, you know, electric fueling stations, things that would be energy efficient, playground updates, signage. Facility, facility expansion, did you say that includes like police? Programs? Yeah, so enhancing the current facilities that we have. So, for example, we have a project that would be for the recreation center to expand their fitness. You know, something that would you know, be able to add more programs or, you know, do something different to the building that we already know. We're not talking about new construction or completely, complete renovation kind of thing, but just things to do to the facilities to that what are we talking about when we say uh, sporting amenities? So that would be like ball field renovations, the lighting in the ball fields, redoing, you know, things in the parks where our baseball teams and soccer teams, you know, our youth sports and things like that that come and use our facilities. So there's quite a few needs in that realm yeah. and to be done in the parks. So that's what I mean by sports. It doesn't include anything at the field house. It, would, it could include the field house as well. Say this is just kind of gen generic, but we get to move to the second one. So this gives you an idea. So public safety improvements being um, the top priority of project types. So we're going to do the same exercise again. Now you advanced to silver right there. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so it's the same project types. But it's a different kind of question, so we're going to have to think a little differently. So rank these projects by the greatest operational impact. So if we do this kind of project, it's going to enhance, you know, perhaps um, maybe creative revenues that might come in. Maybe it might mean there's more programming opportunity or more revenue that the city could bring in and memberships or things like that. What is going to have the greatest impact that could be possibly like a force multiplier, if you will? If we do this in this order, you know, it, it will... And it's nine of these as well? It's the same, it's the same exact uh, project types that we just saw. You said what's going to be the greatest impact? Is that yeah, what, what do you think? If we do these kind of projects, mm -hmm. it would be have the greatest impact to the community. all had a chance to answer? Nope. Does anything kind of surprise you? Does anything kind of surprise you from this kind of order? Or kind of what you expect? <laughs> Matt's happy over there. Does Matt have access to this? <laughs> I get unlimited votes. Okay, I'm writing these up. Thank you for playing along. How many more of these we have to? No, this is just two. This okay. is just it. We don't okay. do any more. It's kind of more, kind of breaking the ice as we try to think about our, our projects and the different kind of projects we have out there and needs. So. But, but Jennifer, on that note, if I could just for a sure. second, since utility is number one, if I could council introduce you to our new assistant director of public works, Matt Bryant. Right. Thank you. Congratulations. That's not interim. That is not interim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to go back to the... When do we meet our project manager? Okay. Um, soon, very soon. I'll probably maybe the next month's meeting. She's just got a conflict on Tuesday nights. That's, <laughs> of, of all That's nights. a little rough. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with the council priorities. Please feel free to add to this list, but... 
the top two things that we've heard over and over again um, from the council, from the community, um, is to focus on finishing up the 2018 bond projects and um, AMI. So we're going to start with those two topics. So walking you through uh, the bond project. So starting with Proposition A, parks. So we already have Rotary Park complete. We have Lakeside Park Pavilion. We have that complete. Armstrong Park is now substantially complete. So the next two projects hanging out there, we have Harrington Park, which we've had the design complete, and now we have to move forward with the, um, the three different phases. And I will show you what those are here in a second. And then lastly, we have trails. We had a million dollars that was designated. Well, 1.5 was designated for trails, but 500,000 is, is, is going into the Harrington Park for the uh, Waterview Bridge Connection Trail. So we have 1 million that's dedicated to trails without any specific uh, identified consensus use for those funds. So we're going to talk about that. So Harrington Park, the total cost at this point is 5.9 million. Um, it has gone up over the past um, year. We've already spent the money on the design. So with the uh, bond <coughs> allocation in there, what's it? The additional fund needed to make this project whole to do all three phases is $3 million, okay? So keep that in the back of your mind. Um, just a side note, as we go through these projects, feel free to highlight and stuff as we're going to come back to these things for a priority exercise later. So this is yours to write and highlight. I put highlighters on here and everything. Yes, ma'am. So you said as we go through these things, mm -hmm. meaning the slide, mm -hmm. and then you want us to look at this at the same time? Yes, because when we get to those slides, it's going to go in that order. So you, you, you highlight the things that you feel are the most important to you, or make note to come back to it, or if you want to make a note that, hey, this, this instru instru interested me, I want to come back to this, ask more questions, whatever. I put highlighters with you also. Okay. Um, you can do that. Okay, so here's the first discussion point that I want to open up at this point in time. How should the trail funds be used? Um, first, going to Harrington Park. Now, here's the project scope, okay? Um, phase one is that new concession and restroom facilities. That price tag is $3 million. Um, the phase two is the parking lot and pavilion. That's $1.9 million. And then the phase three is the bridge and the trail linking Harrington and Waterview Parks. That's about $735,000. So that's how we come up with the construction estimate. We're going to come back to this. So going back to the potential trail projects. So here, we have presented this to you in the past at the other retreats, um, and giving you some ideas on how we should use that um, $1 million that's designated for trails. Um, so here are some ideas to remind you. We have, uh, so we can complete the Daniel Dale Road Diet, which is 750000 is the estimate. For that, that is the top priority for the majority of the parks board. Um, we uh, have a pump track at Lakeside Park, about 300,000 estimate, that is an idea. We've talked about the uh, Clark Road power line easement, doing a trail there, but there's a Velo Web project that's about 2.2 million, perhaps coming down the pipeline with um, North Central Texas COG. Um, we could use it for some downtown connectors, expand on-street bike loops, um, we could actually use some of this trail money. There's a, a variety of projects that have been identified in this list here of some trail and bridge replacement needs throughout our current parks. So that's also an option in which we could utilize the, the trail bond money. So these are just some of the ideas. So can we open it up for a discussion of how to best use the trail funds? Because we'd like to spend that money and, and fulfill the... Um, the desire of the bond committee at the time and the parks board and all the input that's come into having you know allocated so much money for trails so we'd like to move forward with so the, a project the, 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 the Daniel Dale project is the completion of bike lanes going from Maine all the way to Clark Road that yes right? that's correct and we do have the subject matter as experts <coughs> that can pipe in to and I have been this. on record adamantly opposed to it to take our six lanes and make four out of them simply to try and slow down traffic instead of making a bike lane out of it, which is what consultants like to do. They think that that's going to change behaviors for people that like to speed down Danielville. I don't believe that that's true. Somebody's going to get killed. We can put decals down on the lanes. We can call it a bike lane, use a full lane, whatever. But to put those barriers up or to put that, that hardware up like we did over Highway 67, is a total waste of money, in my opinion. 
I've been opposed to it. I completely oppose spending any more money on Danielville in terms of making two more bike lanes for the purpose of what? Not to use it as bike lanes, but the consultants doing the comp plan said this will slow down traffic. And I'm opposed to that. Now, if we want to make something to connect Clark Road and Maine all the way going out to the Cedar Hill Preserve, that's another story. But still in all, putting up barriers to that to create a bike lane, I don't think is a proper and wise use of our money. If we want to put that, put a decal down and says bikes may use full lane like we have other places around the city, that's going to be okay. Then the bikers can choose to use it or not. But our traffic control, simply to do that, I think seven, maybe three quarters of a million dollars on something like that is not the wisest use of our money. Seeing that how the budget as it stands today is something that we have to look at very, very carefully. And so I would agree that with the barriers, uh, I wouldn't be in favor of the barriers. Uh, but it, uh, I recall, because we discussed this at the joint meeting, with the park school, my understanding was they were going to go back and do another traffic study. And that was what we kind of <clears throat> left with. There was that conversation, but there was never, there was, all it was was conversation. Council never directed me to do that. So if you want to do that, somebody needs to make a motion in a second, because there was never a direction from the so council. To the next year, I think the last one was what, 2016 or 2017? Was that, the, was that what was said? I don't remember the date that that was done. Poor Danielville, for sure. The bridge. Oh, I'm sorry. The uh, the new portion of Danielville. Oh yeah, but I think the last traffic study for Danielville was done like in 2016, 2017. From what they said, I don't. Is that? Does anybody recall what they said when the last one was done? I think it was a little bit later. Was it later than that? I really don't. That's just what I recall. So I guess, Mr. City Manager. Would we like to have another traffic study done for Daniel Dale? Um, here's what it's going to prove. It's going to prove that six lanes aren't needed. That's what it's going to prove. It's going to prove that six lanes aren't needed because we, oh yeah, because we had the traffic study done when we did this puppy. Yeah. And, and what's their faces, whoever the consultants were said it's not used enough, so you can go ahead and make it from six down to four. So I said, okay, fine, forget that, I'm not buying that either. But looking at, okay, I'll give you an example. Plano Parkway in the city of Plano. It's six lanes. I have to go to Plano once a month. And I don't see any more traffic on Plano Parkway than what I see on Danielville during different times of the day. But a six-lane parkway through a city is an amenity. And there's no mistaking that Daniel Dale from 67 all the way to Clark Road is a conduit for citizens that may or may not live in the city of Duncanville. Be that as it may, it is a conduit of traffic. Peak periods, it can justify itself. Non-peak periods, it cannot justify itself during a traffic study. Setting that statistic aside, I look at six lanes on Daniel Dale as an amenity for our city. And I would not agree to taking down from six to four lanes simply because of some statistical study that says it's not used well enough. And I know that's what it's going to prove. What was, uh, what was the original thought? Because when I came on board, all this was already settled. And I asked the question, because it was so many problems with that project, so many delays, which is, in my estimation, was a disaster. So normally what, after that kind of a, just a feeling of failure, I'm going to say it, things just stop. So I asked the question, well, what, what are the plans? Because I wasn't here when you all voted on this. What's the plan to continue this and not have somebody get on a bike and drive from 67 <laughs> to Larry Lane and then just stop? What, what's the promise to keep it going? And, and I was kind of told by several individuals at that meeting, oh, it'll, it'll go. It'll go all the way to Clark Road. So this is another example where elected officials, and I'll count me in this too, we talk about things, we make um, reasonable assessments, and then nothing happens. So I guess that's why we're here right now. But this one issue right here is probably more time than we want to take on the discussion today, unless somebody could summarize a proposal for 
project, and I guess that's what we're doing with getting the uh, traffic study redone. I agree, the traffic study is going to show it's not needed. And it absolutely, it's never been needed since the day we put it down. But we got to know, we started something, are we just going to stop it? It almost seems ridiculous, too. Or are we going to find a satisfactory way to complete the concept of having through bike traffic from 67? And it, ultimately, hopefully, Dallas would participate in something. But all we got to do is get to the Clark Road. To, to fulfill the promise, because that's what I heard when I came on. Oh, yeah, we're going to go all the way to Clark Road. Honestly, my feeling has been just not being involved in it, even while I'm on the council, is it ain't never getting to Clark Road. The, in answer to your question, the design was that some, like going over 67 to Maine, that was phase one. And at some later phase, it was going to get extended two more bike lanes, cutting from Danodale down to four, all the way to Clark Road. And there's been so much back and forth discussion on that quite properly, Mr. Contreras, that no decision has been made. So if we're faced with this today, and, and Jennifer's put up, we're looking at another three quarters of a million dollars to, to make two bike lanes on Daniel Dell. I'm saying that the wisest and best use of our city fund is not for that particular project. Let's do it with something else. And whether it's other potential trails or something else, I just think that in terms of, that's an infrastructure project, let's face it, street is infrastructure, whereas trails is more parks and rec in terms of amenity for our cities to participate in community activity. So it almost puts us into two different categories, but I think maybe to what you're saying, Mr. Contreras, let's put this thing to bed and, and say tonight, can't take any votes, can we? <laughs> but we can we can make a discussion and, and say this 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 is this is where I am this is where I feel about it I've been articulate in saying it. I've opposed this for years I've opposed this since 2018 when it was put in the comp plan and I still believe that we will not have enough people riding their bikes down Danielville to support what's being proposed. By citizens, by by consultants. I think a lot of this started uh, with Dallas County trying to connect DeSoto through Duncanville to Dallas to, to Cedar Hill. That's what started it. Um, this was pre-COVID, so it was it was it was moving. Then it stopped. Of course, mm -hmm. we had a lot of staff turnover and whatnot, so the, it never gained momentum. But the purpose, or some of the purposes for having uh, this. The option is to fundraise, to, to try to bring triathlons and, and running sporting events down south because they're all up north. Everything's up north. We've got an auditorium. Of course, if we get the trail, we'll have the bike, and then, of course, the run. And you can post to different places and utilize it. But what has to happen is uh, if you go on Polk Street and Oak Cliff towards uh, Bishop Arts, they chop down a six-lane road to a four-lane, and it slows stuff down. So I'd like to see that study, because that's, that's way busier than, than Danielville. It's busy all the time. And so what you're going to have to do is train the folks to let them see it, to get used to the idea that, you know, eventually there's going to be people on that. Counter to that, Bishop Arts, during that entire section, is commercial property. I mean, I'm there's about, businesses along there. So economic development is, yeah, you ride your bike, you stop, and you get a cup of coffee for $7. Then you can travel another quarter of a mile, you can get a grilled cheese sandwich for $13. <laughs> Daniel Dale doesn't have that. Right. It's pure residential, all the way from Maine going all the way to Clark. And then, well, one last thing for Fish. Uh, I spoke to the uh, superintendent there at the school, uh, Finch Tech, and I asked him if it would be an advantage or disadvantage to have that. He said it would definitely be an advantage. Now, I don't know how. I just asked him, you know, because I don't, I don't, I don't go through. Go that. on Daniel Dale at three o'clock in the afternoon and see the citizens have created two lanes, but waiting in line to get their kids out of Village Tech. But I'm thinking he's talking about the bridge and walkability and, and bikes, because otherwise there's no way to get across there. So. Yeah. So. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I'm throwing this out as a different viewpoint. By reducing that down from six to four, you're reducing road maintenance and repair and that stuff for a long period of time. Uh, and then it's kind of like, I'd almost, Ms. Shannon, see, manager, almost like to see an analysis of, of if 
you did that, what's your long term savings? Well, overall, I, mean, I think I think that's just kind of a fair thing that could go into the in into making a decision about this. <clears throat> fair. Mr. Well, Contreras, did you have another comment, sir? Yeah, uh, this is actually more levity. I was driving eastbound on on Daniel Dale, came to the red light at Daniel Dale was 67, and right in front of the uh, the Exxon station right there. Um, public right away, there's a green sign with a bicycle and it says bike route end. About 20 feet ahead of it, there's a black and white sign that says bike lane begin. Um, maybe that makes sense to bike ride. But uh, when I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, I have no idea why the two signs are so close together and they seem to be saying the opposite thing or you got a little dead space in between so just uh, something for signs and signals to look at and see if we got the correct signs up there well not, you know if you, if you come across that bridge at Dan, at daniel dale on the 67th bridge it goes down to two lanes at daniel dale 67 goes down to two lanes you cross main street it goes back to three lanes how did that happen the engineers and the designers and the consultants who designed that thing put this piece of concrete out there to make a right hand turn lane. So you come across and then you hit that bump, all of a sudden you tear the bottom out of your car and it now goes back to three lanes. To me, it was a design flaw. That's how that's that's how those signs got screwed. It was the, it was an engineering design flaw. But it got built that way. Because of that thing right there. Kind of keep moving along. Something to consider, just to put in the back of your mind when we get to that point when we talk about parks and recreation. Is that? Oh, no, I did. I did. Um, so we're still in the same place we were before. Jennifer, how much was the amount again? It was uh, what's left is nine hundred thirty-two thousand. Okay. So council, I mean, clearly there's a lot of discussion that you want to have in terms of that, but. Is there something that you want us to focus on for 25 from like this? And when we get to that, because we are going to walk through the list, there are a variety of uh, current trails and bridges that are in need of repair and replacement and updates. So that is a thought that, hey, why not take care of maybe what we have now versus waiting on something that we don't have yet. So I want to keep that in the back of your mind, too, when we get to that point. Did you want to say something? Sorry. Yes, ma'am. So yeah, I know we've been trying to move on, but been bringing this up for I don't know how many meetings saying hey we need to do something with money we need to do something with it and we keep doing what we're doing right now or we'll, we'll get back to it and so but there's one other uh, option um, and so DeSoto they're working on a walk and bike trail coming from the, in the opposite direction coming from uh, the east and so you know, so we do have another option of going the other way on the other side of 67 connecting with each other and in that way I mean we're doing something with this money now we're showing that yes you know we're working on the phases right but we're phasing it out but I mean you can tell we're not coming to a conclusion or consensus on what we're going to do on Daniel Dale going the other way so you know, I think we should look at that option as well um, and that's also part of the, the county's plan so so that there, there's another option there, and I, I'd be interested in seeing what, in seeing what costs might be. I think it's maybe it's like half a mile, and maybe even less, you know, from six to seven to Cockle Hill, and then getting in communication with the city of Soto and seeing what their plans are. And the only issue with that is there's a significant downhill, but there are ways to make that safe. And there's plenty of right away on top of Hill and 67 where we can put continue the trail that we are now without having to mess with the street. One of the things we haven't gotten the funding strategies yet, but I had a conversation. TxDOT uh, is going to be coming out pretty soon here with a grant and Senate package that's 50% uh, that would include sidewalks, it would include bridges, roads, and all that stuff. I mean, if you guys want to say you want to take that 900000 and put it as a placeholder to be the match and go after some grant money, we might be able to do that and explore that. Have we ever done, in association with the 
with the reduction down to from four to six to four and the bike trail. Have we ever uh, done a survey with the residents in that area who use that more than anybody up, say, up in my district? Have we ever done a survey to get some feedback from them on this issue? I will say feedback, but my feedback is complaints, but I hear about that too. And it, you go down Daniel Dale, don't you? Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I don't have the issue with when I go down Daniel Dale. And if I see the school, I just go, Joe Wilson, or around the other way. It's like, 60 seconds out of my way, maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, those are the people that most use it in Duncanville residents. That's the most people that use it are going to be uh, anywhere from Swan Ridge to mm -hmm. uh, Venice and Sparta and all that, and right. all the way down to Greenstone. So, Clark. To, well, to Clark, absolutely. I use Daniel so, Dale five times so a day. So, wouldn't it be? valuable to us, even that we've started it, to ask those people in those neighborhoods <coughs> what they think of a continuation of, a lot of them are going to be upset over the delays that they had to go through getting to 67, so they might just say no, but I think it'd be worth it to, to ask them. District 1, have you heard anything? I didn't any surveys or anything for that. The last new thing of that nature was a town hall for the bond projects and priorities and whatnot. That's the last time that's. Yeah, they're the end users on this. Well, you are because you live right there. So those of you that live in that area and use that more often, I think you would think that your neighbors would, before we do it, because let's say we go ahead and we go through with this and all of a sudden it's going down to two lanes and we get the complaints that we got the front end of the project. We should be prepared on what the citizen response is going to be. I think it's a good idea to go ahead and do the survey and then gather from users what the questions are to be. They're like, do you own a bike? Yes or no. Would you use it if it had a bike? Yes or no. How many times do you travel down there? In terms of, you know, how, how often do you use it? So the questions have to be very carefully crafted by an external third party who understands traffic management. So there is money. That kind of, of a survey is going to cost a good fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to design a survey and manage that survey, and then complete the process as well. That, that, now that becomes another budget item. There we can have before. We can spend a million dollars. So I got another fun discussion here in a second. So we'll come. Yeah. We'll kind of come back to this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so council or proposition B. So these are the streets we uh, have. Daniel Dale, that's substantially complete. Right now we're in the design phase for Cedar Ridge. That should be wrapping up pretty soon here in the spring. And hopefully we'll have construction starting in um, summer, fall time. The question that remains kind of on the table is the, uh, the third project that was nominated by the, um, the bond committee, I guess it's the Main Street and Camp Wisdom. So we need your direction, council. Like, do we still hang on to this idea? Because the idea we remember um, with Dallas County that was going to help with you know some projects, and they suggested the roundabout there on center, and, and that was uh, decided not to go forward with that. So we really don't have any other, I guess, projects identified at this time um, for that area. So we had 1.5 million that was kind of the placeholder for that project. We can certainly we hang on to it for something else. Main Street Camp right. Wisdom. Do we redirect it maybe to some other street projects or? I got a rewind. Uh, yes, please do. Before your time, Matt, I don't know if you remember this. It wasn't in your wheelhouse at the time. Enlighten me, sir. <laughs> um, because of what happened with the grade, the whole point of that money was to fix the grade at Main Street and Camp Wisdom. That's when we ran into the problem with the county. And BNSF said, BNSF said, you can do what you want, but don't ask us for a dime. So what are what the, return, the alternatives were build a bridge. Build the bridge <clears throat> over Camp Wisdom going either way, you fix it. And the cost was somewhere in three million plus as a minimum. That was it. As a minimum. And we knew all of a sudden we had a million dollars to play. So we were already two million in the hole. That's just design. So then the county, knowing that we couldn't use the money for that particular project, got involved, and as Jennifer said, 
without our knowledge, they had their engineers decide a roundabout to use the million dollars. And the county said, use your million dollars, and the county will contribute a matching million dollars, and we will put a roundabout in your city, and we will shut down Santa Fe, and we will shut down Nance, and we'll put a roundabout there. And this, around this table, we looked at it and said, no, we really don't want to be shutting down doing that in the roundabout. So we thankfully said, or we said, thank you very much, county. We prefer not to do a roundabout. So that million dollars is still sitting in a bucket. So then the discussion was looking at Camp Wisdom and going toward the east, what can we do to refurbish those buildings, those commercial properties that face I-20 and make them more appealable in terms of a, a commercial area? And then we looked at you know what's happened with the hotel, with the frontage roads, and so forth. That would be a proper use of that million dollars if we were to go that way. Now, here's where the, the hitch comes. Because of my participation on the RTC, at an RTC meeting, it was demonstrated, it was, it was briefed to us by Jeff Neal of the RTC at the COG that there would be federal money available if projects were identified where railroad crossings were a safety hazard. I went, antenna goes up. I identified Camp Wisdom and Main Street as a federally funded project. Jeff Neal at the COG said it, it qualifies. Is it dangerous? And on, like on three different criteria, that thing qualifies for federal money. It qualifies for state money. It qualifies for the COG contributing. It qualifies for us. That project was turned over to public works. And Mr. City Manager, that project has died over there so much. And I'm letting you know that this, that this is a possibility to fix that grade with federal money because it is a dangerous intersection as qualifying by federal criteria. We can get federal money, and that has gone nowhere. So in my last days, just letting you know, it's on somebody's desk over there. And Jeff Neal at the COG was all about it. He's, he's on the R, he's with the RTC. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. And I agree with what you're saying as well, and, and what I would, would would say. I don't I don't like it when you have bond projects and you designate it and say we're going to fix Main Street, and then you don't do what you say you're going to do. And and so, but but back to what you were saying, Dallas County graded. It didn't grade out, and thus they came with the, the other alternative. Uh, so what what I'm going to say is is yes, we need to go for the federal to fix that. The the, the main street money needs to be. I'm going to say goes to Cedar Ridge. It, it needs it needs to go somewhere else. The money needs to be used because it's sitting there. It's it's just again a continual cycle. It's going to cost more. It's going to cost more. It's going to cost more to get it done. So, so my recommendation is to apply that towards Cedar Ridge and get it started and going. Mr. Contreras, <clears throat> I'm all about getting Cedar Ridge started and going. And I'll get deeper into this as we go through here, but I don't, I don't see much of anything in here that's in District Five. There is something. Compared to the other districts, this thing is predominantly four other districts. Okay, so when I see that million and a half up there, and I know we got four hundred thousand dollars in tip money we haven't used in over two years, um, I'd like to see Camp Wisdom spruced up. I'd like to see the center medians uh, done with with some type of landscaping, and that's an entryway, one of the main entryways into Duncanville, and it gets you to Main Street, and people will get off of I twenty to come here. So I'm going to throw in for what it's worth. I'd like to see money like that put back towards, uh, and Duncanville Road, by the way, same thing. That center median on Duncanville Road, I don't think it's been fixed. But, you know, right in front of uh, Liberty Square, it's kind of leaning, just kind of heaved up. It looks terrible. It's functional, I guess, for what it is. The paved stones are all falling out. But I'd like to see projects like that up in, start to think about putting some money up there because like I said we got four hundred thousand dollars of tip money that's gonna run out sooner or later. I was told by Gus that you can always re, re reclaim it. But I'm 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 afraid that one day that reclaim is gonna end up with somebody else. Um, 
But when I see that million five and you're looking for something to do with it, I, I want to throw my two cents in for District 5 because there's not much more going on here. We have just, again, it looks like we're the stepchildren up there. Yeah, and, and I, I like the comment, Greg, because I, I do agree we need to take care of the entry rates and that stuff too. But this is specific bond money that's dedicated towards bond projects. So, well, so it's just, well, we got a bond project. No, it's a, that's a point well taken, Don. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that, but I, I can see where you're going with that. Well, it's just, it has to be other streets related projects, right? So it doesn't necessarily, so it could be used on Camp Woods, you know, another section of Camp Woods. <clears throat> so, well, it says up there uh, above, it says Main Street slash Camp Wisdom. I, I, I don't know how much of Camp Wisdom is meant to be in that that um, statement up there. And Jennifer, you, you put that together, so what, um, what, is that, what does that well, mean? Well, the way you know it was allocated, it was defined Main Street, Camp Wisdom, I'm not sure. You're just talking about the intersection? Mm -hmm. Not expanding out? But that's what I said. When, when things fell through with the bridge and the roundabout, that's when it was talked about. Let's do something with those businesses that face I-20, mostly going toward the east of yeah. Camp Wisdom. Because you're traveling down I-20, you look up, and what do you see? You see the backside of the, of the strip malls. And so that's where it was thought that we could really make those nicer looking and more appealable to the customer, to individuals traveling down I-20. It's mostly the eastbound side. Yeah, Jennifer. Well, I guess my point, or maybe it's a question now, is that it doesn't have to go toward another bond project that's streets related. It can go to another streets related project, even though it's not. Yeah, bond my bond. understanding of, you know, since it's streets, you don't have to specifically with the, the three projects that were identified, but as long as it's still towards streets and reconstruction. And if that's the case, that I would also be in favor of looking at uh, other project opportunities further east on Camp Wisdom, especially since that's, that's an opportunity area, by the way, that you yeah, haven't done anything yet lately. And as an aside, you know, aside part of what Greg was talking about, that that money that's sitting in the tip, there's very specific criteria in the use of that money. It's sidewalks, it's landscaping, it all deals with infrastructure. So there's four hundred thousand dollars sitting in the tip. Now I never got an answer that the EDC, way back when when I was on the EDC, we donated one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in seed money to that. I never really got a firm answer if that one hundred and fifty thousand dollars has ever been paid back because it was a loan. It, has it, it hasn't been. It has not. Okay, so decrement 400 by 150. <laughs> <laughs> we have to pay them back pretty soon. So. Cool. So, <laughs> Council, though, there, there's a couple of things I want to share with you with all this. There, there's a couple of moving things to keep in mind. Right now, we're doing an update to the comprehensive plan, right? We will be soon. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see what the community says that they want, right? We, we have an economic development report coming very, very soon, uh, hopefully in the month of May. Um, as a result of the DCEDC's uh, endeavors. The DCEDC is also very, very interested in what Main Street and Camp Wisdom, especially from uh, Station 1 east towards, well, at least Duncanville Road, if not further, right, and what that looks like. The Arts Commission would like to see that as an arts and cultural type area. The DCEDC would like to see that. Um, Additionally, there's a what's called a transportation alternative grant that's getting ready to be released. Uh, it's a federal program where we have to pay 20% of the grant, which would be, instead of us guessing about what it is that would make the biggest impact, we could go for that grant, and it's probably going to be a hundred, dollars $200,000 study, and we'd only have to pay 20% of it. We could probably even use some of that money to help fund the grant. It would give us very, very specific action items relative to Camp Wisdom, relative to roadway improvements, well, relative to Main Street. The reason why I just, I, I say about Main Street and specifically, I think what you're gonna find as a result of some of the comp plan stuff, some of the feasibility type stuff, there's going to be questions that are gonna to come to council about changing zoning, changing a whole variety of things and what that might look like to really improve the area and then then there's going to be all kinds of additional economic development money right, that could help with these projects. I mean, the DCEDC is sitting on $6.8 million currently, right, that they can help to invest. And so there, there's a variety of different ways we could go and kind of stretch these dollars and make it even much more meaningful than a $1.5 million project, right? Because Cedar Ridge has basically the money to do almost the whole thing, right? 
between with the With utility two. funds, yeah. Right. Yeah. It might need a couple hundred thousand dollars, but we can complete it based on what was in the bond project. So, uh, so we have alternatives on how we can fund these other projects or these projects. What is that? We have different options as far as funding the projects. Well, there's always options, yeah. Uh -huh. So, and especially if we're going to really try to stretch these dollars using grant proceeds to, to you know go after some applications, especially for some planning grants, because. We're still very much in planning stages with a lot of this. We're not yet ready to go to construction, unless you guys want to just go straight to something to do something. So. Yeah. So then, my question now: What are we doing here tonight? We're going on. Yeah, we we so kind of need to move from, along because. Yeah. We need so to you're get just to basically those. briefing us now on what we need, and then kind of think about and prioritize from there. Okay. And it's good discussion too, and if they're we still on the same page of where we're going with it versus, you know, next year we're having the same conversation. And next year we're having the same conversation. Right. These have been just kind of stagnant. Okay. So it's having yeah. Well, I mean that's that was kind of my point because you know, I'm starting to have deja vu here. And <laughs> you know, and, and thank you, Jennifer, you're giving us some pretty straightforward questions here. Okay, we're having a discussion. Do we continue to hold the funds for Main Street Campism or should we re redirect to other streets projects? So I, I'd kind of like to hear from my colleagues that got a hard answer one way or another on that. I mean, from what I've heard, it sounds like people saying we want to redirect that to other projects. I mean, we could, could certainly we'll come back, and we're not saying we're not giving a hard answer today. But with collecting your responses, yeah. be able to provide you here are some real options. Yeah, mayor, After we look at the federal funding. Clear. I'm still saying that million dollars that we have in a bucket that we haven't spent could be put toward Camp Wisdom in the Main Street grade with a federal grant. It could qualify if we just put that thing up, find it, and let's get it in and get it qualified. Now, it has to, it's competition, let's face it, but that, that federal grant for that particular intersection is a competitive process. So we really have to sit down and, and dig it and put statistics and what's the danger of it. But Jeff and Neil can help. They know how to do that. That's what the COG is for, the RTC is for, to help us get grants done so we can get money. You've been on RTC for, for six five. years. When you get ready to leave, you want to do a competitive grant as you're <laughs> exiting at the door. <laughs> but it's just. Right, we can they, do that, but I'm It saying, has been sent somewhere in public in works for two years. Ah. Okay? Well, we'll move on um, from this. But so, just finishing up on um, the other proposition: fire station is substantially complete, yay. Um, and then service center is the last one. And um, our recommendation is to wait until we get the facilities assessment to really understand what um, decisions need to be made, you know, in terms of uh, the building. So we originally estimated about 5.2 based on the current design that was already put out there and everything. But really, to service that building is really what it needs to be. It's going to be probably more. 10 million. So, but once we have that facilities assessment, we'll be able to revisit this topic. So, Mayor, so I don't know if now's a good time to discuss it or other, other discussions, and I would like to have some discussion about the old fire station. So, should that be later again? Yeah, if we have time. We're just talking about yeah. projects right now. Yeah. Do you use it's it? up to you. Don't tear it down, make it something else. <laughs> Okay, so the next big uh, priority, we're not going to get into the weeds so much. I'm just reminding you of AMI. We've had this discussion. You've been presented this by Public Works at multiple times. You know, we know we have aging um, water meters um, and infrastructure and, and um, 10 years or older. Um, we've seen these analysis, you know, our water revenue had been going down, but we have implemented, you know, the rate uh, increase structure models for um, recuperating some of that revenue. Um, and then, you know, what the objectives are with, you know, obviously having AMI, um, conservation, greater building accuracy, transparency, you know, real-time kind of data. So um, we'll come back to the AMI, but those are the two big things, you know, we wanted to make sure we discuss with y'all um, for what we've heard the council priority. So, um, Jennifer, can we yes. pause on that quick second? Is the council still in agreement to move forward with AMI, generally speaking? Yeah. Yes. Right? Because we're looking at some different funding strategies. David and I have had a series of meetings where it's probably a 12 and I know Matt's had some specific meetings too and, and it's 
we're, we're working on bringing stuff together so that we can bring a complete proposal. But, you know, it's probably a $12 million project, give or take. Um, but there is financing options for us to actually not bond, but actually do a, a loan against the project, um, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of closer to $20 million so that it would give us money, like, for instance, to do the improvements that we need to the service center. And we'd be able to pay that back probably in 10 or 15 years because the project would pay for itself over that time period. So we're really looking through and working so through some of that, but we'll bring that back to you completely separate. Okay. Yeah, just from uh, this might just be a perception standpoint. So, and I'm all in favor of the, the automated uh, meters. Um, but as we charge forward with that, we make it public, we're moving forward with that. I would think we'd want to make a significant dent in identifying our water losses that you presented a few meetings ago because it was significant. So, you know, on one hand, we're going to become real efficient charging our customers. But on the other hand, we can't account for a bunch of money leaking on our side, a bunch of water leaking. So I think it would be very transparent of us to make sure we have significantly, we started something to assess and, and catch these. Uh, we've, I know we've done a few here lately. It's a good start, but we've got a long way to go. So I, I just want to make sure that the public is seeing that while we're tightening down on their water meter readings to be more efficient and to bring in more revenue, that we're not just allowing these water breakages to go without uh, without having a, a, an agreement in place about what we're going to do to remedy, find them and, and remedy as many as we can. It's a very fair point, and the proposal would definitely include that. We've had some conversations, and especially in Matt with his new role, we'll be working very closely with Matt. Um, but that will all be included, and we'll detail all that. The 10 million gallons that was lost last year, we'll go through all that analysis. I've already been talking to some of the companies that I've been talking to. I know Matt's been having some conversations, and we'll detail all of that. It'll be very, very transparent about that. But thank you. But thank you. Okay, so just to briefly go over, I'm not going to do much detail, just what we're currently working on that we're looking hopefully to finish here pretty soon. So for the park side, you know, they're working on that lab, uh, nature preserve master plan. Um, we'll be taking that to uh, looking through the um, proposals at this point, right? Um, uh, they accept it, so that's coming from okay. the council for a briefing and then um, ready for action. So we have a dog park, you know, we're um, looking at that, that design. Um, obviously Harrington Park Bond waiting to... to Kind of get the green light there to, to move forward with that and then of course um, the trails um, on the public work side we have a lot going on over there um, cedar ridge road is in design 10 mile creek is in construction that's wrapping up swan ridge road is pretty much wrapping up um, we have um, two alley projects happening um, for cherry street and center street that's phase one is constructing the second phase is in design um ren oral avenue aerial that's in construction. Five. Yes, District 5, <laughs> Southwood Aerial Construction, what's that, District 4? Uh, Harrington Aerial, um, Stewart Branch, that's in design. Summit Pump House, working on that generator, that's in construction. Skater replacement, that's in, um, in progress, I think, through the end of the year. when We hope to have that live. Um, we're still working on some pipe bursting from the previous two years. Uh, we got the lead service line inventory starting. And then um, what will be brought to you next council meeting actually is a sidewalk project on Oriole Boulevard, which is a CGBG grant funding District project, five. District 5. You know, you're getting your stuff. Um, so you'll be seeing that at the next council meeting. So these are the things that are in motion currently. On the, the Cherry Street, the center alley, the, is that is the phase, two, phase one, is that the east of North Alexander? And then phase two is west? Top of my head, I'm not for sure. That was in, okay, because they just complete one, one's just recently completed, mm -hmm. and so I'll make note to bring back that answer for you. Okay, quite sure. In that same man. Okay. When did Matt become acting? I mean, no. about two hours ago. Okay. <laughs> um, fair, fair He's question. not acting. Fair you had a question. Question. Not not acting. Acting. If you had a question about water, I'm your guy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like yeah. questions to Matt, like make note. <laughs> Matt, Fair enough. We'll look into that and get back to you. That's what we say. So. Question, and maybe further down the slide. The uh, proposed, I think in 2018, there was uh, part of the bond package was to build a walkable bridge over Oriole, over I-20. That's not in the plan with the bonds. 
that I'm aware of. Well, it was. It was. I got, I got a map at home that Greg Ramey gave me, and it was part of the project. When we were put replacing that pipe over the bridge, yes, sir. Yeah. Running parallel with that was a, a walkable, walkability bridge, and it was on there. I'm not familiar with the walkability okay. bridge. Uh, I don't know about, about the area. The one one the sure. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember that being a bottom. It, it, was on, it was on the list of projects to be done. I'll bring, I'll bring, no, no, I'll bring I, I, I would agree that is on the list of projects to be done. <coughs> but not a bottom. Okay, maybe not. All right, thank you. It's on the shelf. Okay, so now moving on to this great big sheet right here. So these are the top uh, CIP priorities, again, identified um, by staff. Um, I included all five years here, but we're only going to focus on um, priority ones there. So starting kind of at the beginning here, we're going to kind of walk through this list. If you see something like it's in green, I don't have a number there, so, um, but it was nevertheless identified as a top priority for that department. So uh, without further ado, we're going to start with the uh, field house. So when I add up all of the top priorities, number one, that price tag for that first year comes out to be $78 million. So that is all funding sources, not just, you know, the unknowns. There, that could be utility, part of that could be drainage, part of that could be bond money. Um, but these are, again, um, the full burden, I guess, of the top priorities that um, we've identified. So. Field house. Wait, 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 wait. Um, yes. Yeah. So, you just said seventy million dollars. Mm -hmm. So if we go down FY twenty twenty five. Yes. If you look to the very end. back, because again, I can only print so much, and I'll email this out to you too from a spreadsheet perspective. But if you look at the very, very back, last page, it does have the grand totals. So there is a page that has um, all years, you know, grand total, um, kind of broken down by the funding type. But then on the last page, it has um, it broken down by just the priority ones. But it has that total. Um, Where? Yeah. So if we turn the page back to here, it has a grand total here. Oh, page, so you can, page 11. Yeah, page 11 of 13. 11. Yeah, it kind of gives you that. There it is. If we were to do everything in the first year, you know, it comes out about $78 million. Okay. Yeah. So field house, that's the first uh, few items here. So. Um, they need a new HVAC system. That's so, 750. Sure. Did can we just get an update? It's 1.2? Of course, over 1.2. Yeah, for the HVAC. It's actually 1.2 months. However. It changes that total. Yeah, that changes that total. However, what I would say is specifically, Council, you know, we've been talking uh, about our new relationship with the DCEDC, and I've been having conversations with them. I fully expect them to fund this, so it's not. Uh, while we have to monitor it and everything else, I think that uh, I, I feel really confident. They're excited about the new collaboration. They, they've been partnering with us in the interviews for the economic development director and assistant director. And they're very excited about it. So again, as we go through this, make your notes. I like things that you know you feel are, are, are most important to you. Um, as we're going to have to do a priority exercise at the end of this with, with, with these projects. So, so again, um, build house, now that that's 1.2 million, um, they need a new roof, it's over 20 years old, that's about 225,000 was the estimate. They need to replace all of their grill and cafe equipment, um, that's about 65,000. And it's true the HVAC equipment's located on the roof? And then they also need to replace all their exterior glass doors um, in the building, and that's uh, quoted at 36000 Do you have any specific questions about these particular projects? Those were their priorities. Just a comment. I think there's more than that. There's some bigger ones. There's four big ones, and there's a bunch of small ones. So just a comment. Regardless of any discussions going on with contracting this out, this all this has to be done no matter what. Yes. Okay. So the burden is on the city for this money. We need to look at it that way regardless of what happens with the field house. The field house does not, other than probably what they bring in and expend, there's no other really at this point identified a source of funding for these. So. Well, and Mayor, if I just follow up on your side note, but there literally is nothing to discuss anymore with any outside entities, so we'll be starting from scratch. So it remains in-house? It moment. will remain city facility. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. So 
moving ahead past the field house. Um, this is kind of like the catch all police, fire, general government. Um, so the fire department has requested um, their top priority, um, having some foundation repairs, emergency repairs. That's actually going to be in this year's budget. So we're not necessarily planning um, out for that, but just notating that because that was a top priority for them. Um, they would like to purchase a wildland paramedic unit slash EMS cart. It's approximately $82,000, and what that is, they can use that at special events, for example. It's a lot more maneuverable for the, the big crowds and everything if they have to respond to an emergency event. Um, also, they're able to deploy these vehicles. You know, if they um, are asked for an aid somewhere else in the state, for example, they can deploy these vehicles, and they can be used, and we get reimbursed back, not just for our firefighters' time, but also the equipment that we deploy. Um, we do get uh, funding back for um, for the use of our equipment. So, you know, in theory, after a couple of years, if we're able to deploy this, we can actually recover the purchase of this um, particular cart. And we can um, let some other cities uh, I borrow it as well. Um, in three years, we're going to need to replace another fire engine. Um, this is a 10-year um, replacement cycle for engines. They're on the front line for 10 years, and they go on the back uh, as a reserve for another 10 years. With the um, ordering and the demand for these type of equipment, it's going to take three years by the time you know when it comes due, and um, three years to build before we actually receive it. So we're asking if we can go ahead and you know purchase one now, so when it does come, come due, um, then we um, will be able to replace it timely. So approximately that cost is $1.6 million. Um, the fire station also needs to repair um, ADA uh, compliant you know, sidewalks in front of uh, fire station two. That cost is uh, $11 million. Um, regional dispatch, they had community. $11,000. I'm sorry, that's what I meant. <laughs> thank you, thank you. 11000 So many zeros. No, 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 too many zeros. It, it's right, just not out of my mouth. Forgive me, thank you. Keep me straight. So uh, regional dispatch and uh, the city manager might have some updates um, in this conversation, but um, what they had communicated to us last year, they have plans to construct a whole new dispatch center in the next few years. They had asked, that, you know, that if we, being that we are a third, um, have one third partnership in that, that uh, we need to give them some, some funding for upgrades to their current facility. Last year, they had projected a million dollars. Um, that would be due in 25 to go towards um, upgrades, and then in FY28 would be um, when we would owe them for the construction of the new facility. But uh, Mr. Bench, I don't know if you have any updates that's that changed that's since last the year. Council. This was the council item. I remember coming to council that we were briefed on this expense mm -hmm. to, to I, upgrade I the regional dispatch center and whether we were going to contribute our fair share to that. I think that was the CAT system. So. That is moving forward. That's the software. This, I believe, the can is being kicked down the road, at least for the time being. So the CAD system is the oh. software communication system and all that. Total cost of $6.4 million. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. Over the next 10 years. Yeah. But this is a replacement of the building? This would be a new facility. They would also like a new training facility and everything else. But there's no, at this point, I think, of given the light of the expense for the CAD system and a variety of other expenses. I think it's shifted to a few more years out. So. I think that was mentioned to us in November by Mr. Brown. He briefed us on it uh, in that retreat. Yeah. Uh, so I guess. Just to say, Greg. One, one other thing that was mentioned uh, last year was that it was suggested that we reevaluate our use as three, a third contributor, when you start looking at the number of responses, the number of calls, and you break it down, that slowly as Cedar Hill and DeSoto are growing, their demands are greater. And so uh, there was a suggestion that we revisit our agreement to see if we truly are a third, a third, and a third, because it was apparent that we were already drifting away from that and as such, should we be contributing as much just to be a part of the three if it doesn't equal out? Uh, Pro rata share. There you go. So last year, Duncanville's calls were 67,231 for police, 7,015 for fire. Cedar Hills was 61,649 for police, 8,062 for fire, almost the exact almost same. Almost DeSoto had 11,726 for fire. And they had 118,079 for police. 
but that's the way they categorize it. So basically to pipe that in half. And they do have the lion's share, but they also are absorbing the lion's share of the expense for it. Right. It's not actually a third, a third, a third. They're, they're, they're covering a lot more expense, all the IT expense, a lot of that and everything. So, I mean, we can revisit it, but the numbers are, and that's brand new numbers that I just got. Um, the police department, their top priority is a new building, a new police station. So we, that price tag is roughly $20 million just based on some more recent um, cities uh, around us that have built some new facilities about how much it is. Obviously, that would be a conversation probably for another bond election in the near future, but that is um, also included in the $78 million. So, um, Where is it on here? Yes, it's on page 413, and I just wanted to point out uh, on here it says building new or updates. So you know, that doesn't necessarily have to be a new building, but it could be updates, remodel, building up. I know we've kind of talked a little bit about that with some of the facilities. So um, I just want to put that out there so because this kind of takes in the direction of new building or nothing else, but it's new or update or remodel. Is that being examined in the facilities assessment, Mr. Pound? Police, excuse me, police and fire is being done in the operational analysis, but the facility assessment that includes everything else. Yeah. And for me, like the police, since it's, it's alphabetized by department, you'll find the, the police is on page four. Um, and then um, police uh, would like four uh, patrol pursuit vehicles. Now we have. 15 vehicles technically in our fleet rotation program. So if every department you know, contributes into the fleet repl replacement fund, um, they have four patrol vehicles. It's kind of like, you know, once we replace this, it'll kind of take the best of the replacements and kind of put it on the back end, if you will, for any emergencies or if, you know, something breaks down, they can put that into, into service. But what they would like to do um, is to replace these four uh, vehicles that are um, at backup, um, these are 2019 vehicles. They bought them in 2018 um, and then put those into the rotation so they would have 19 total patrol vehicles. And this will allow them to, um, number one, make sure that they have adequate uh, um, vehicles that are in service, that are reliable, as well as um, it'll allow us to stretch out how often we actually replace those uh, police vehicles because those get a, a big beating. They're, they're always on. They, um, engine miles and everything, um, they have to replace those a lot sooner. So um, that could push us out to maybe every three years um, as we have an adequate fleet for the police department. So the cost of those is based on the most recent estimate that we have already taken to council for police patrol people. So, And then the last item is um, a million dollar transfer to help replenish the fleet rotation fund. We have not been contributing at 100% into this fund over the years, so it's starting to come down in terms of what's available. We have 1.1 million still left to replace in the current um, rotation schedule, and um, that would completely uh, draw, uh, completely use up all the funds for that. So this will help keep that whole so we can keep moving forward with the replacements on time without having to um, come back for more funding in the future for so, uh, future so what fund is the fleet rotation fund funded? <laughs> <laughs> There's funded by all the cost centers. They put in a contribution based on the patrol, the vehicles that they have allocated to them, and it puts in a percentage based on, you know, I'm going to replace this in 10 years. It's going to, you know, feasibly be this much in 10 years, and, it, you know, it's a contribution that hits the budget every year. So it keeps the budget kind of um, more but flat versus up and down. I don't think you're going to answer the question. No, no, no. Okay. So what fund is like, the... From what fund is the money going to be transferred to replenish the fleet rotation fund? Well, this, this would be, if it's a high priority for you in the exercise, it would come probably from general fund or... There's the answer. Or fund balance. Okay. You know. Yeah. It comes out of the general fund. That's what yes, yes. Yes. Um, could we just... So, we just approved a purchase of six. Six yes. Six vehicles. Okay. So, this, this four is in addition to... Yes. Yeah. It would make their fleet at 19. Okay. Yeah. Because they already have it. It's just on a backup and not in the rotation. So they just put the ones that they're not using anymore that are the best of the already um, hard used vehicles on the back end. <laughs> so the anticipation okay. is fiscal year 25, our ad valorem income is going to be sufficient enough going into the general fund. 
to move $1 million from the general fund into the fleet rotation fund without decrementing the general fund to where we're not able to operate. We'll get to that <laughs> when we talk about So again, these are, these are the ideas are our priorities. doesn't mean we can do them all. They're just reaching us now to make the decisions okay. later. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. We're just telling you what the needs are, yeah. and there's a lot of them. <laughs> so we do have to prioritize even the priorities. So. All right, getting into parks and recreation. So out of that 78 million, um, 18 million um, are top priorities. And that also includes the bond projects like the Harrington Park and the trails that are also included in that 18 million. So I've kind of, there's a lot of different ones on here, but I've pretty much grouped them by project type here. So of course the top two would be the bond project. So again, we said we need 3 uh, million additional dollars coming from general fund or you know some source um, to make that project whole. Um, so getting to the third bullet point there um, are park buildings. So this would be like concession stands, restrooms, storage facilities. Um, on your, on your um, again, I tried to, um, out, uh, tried to, do, to sort by project type so you can kind of see if it's labeled as a building, it's going to fall into this uh, park building. So there's a you're Alexander, back on, you're back on page one. Yeah, I'm still on page one. Oh. Yeah, it's a lot of parks and recs. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of parks and recs. So um, there's a, Alexander needs a new concession and restroom storage facility. That's about four hundred thousand. There's a replace the restroom at Lions Park. Um, Lions Park needs a storage facility. The recreation center, fitness center would like to expand. We had originally designated ARPA funds to do that, but we had to throw what we could at the fire station to get the fire station done. So um, um, they want to expand their restroom so they can add some showers. You know, have showers at a fitness center. Who thought, right? Yeah. Um, Redbird needs to expand their restrooms, rotary. So there's a variety of different building needs at the uh, different parks. So when you add them all up together, those building-related uh, projects is about 2.1 million. This will cost more than cookies. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did you have a question? Yeah. So, uh, so Lions Park. Uh, what? What all? Yeah, just look at the list. So there's a couple of things that come to mind. Um, but both of the signs are, one sign's already rotten, fell down. The other one's just about there, right? Uh, there's a crosswalk that there was supposed to be put in. If you ask, there was a crosswalk put in if you're coming down the hill. Yeah. Uh, so east of the crosswalk. Was, yeah, it's faded out. Yeah, so the, the kind of crosswalk there, and then I don't know if this is included in the drainage improvements, but uh, along the trail that goes back behind the neighborhood, it's you know, the, the sidewalk's about to be eroded down into the creek. So I don't know if that's part of the riprap and the drainage improvements. But you know, so I don't know how much of that is Lions Park because it's quite a bit of work there. Yeah. Well, to some of it, Jennifer, we have pages of parks and recreation identified here. Yeah. But this one slide is taking everything we see and summarizing it and saying these are the top priorities of everything. So everything that's up here, yes, is, is a number one for the parks department. Yeah, because there's so, lots and lots Yeah, there's, there's a lot of individual parks, needs, but they can be they are rolled up. They can be rolled up into these kind of project types. Just to, you know, so we don't have five slides identifying them all. That's what I was asking. But um, so I, to try to group them together. Mm -hmm. And um, so park building, so bridges and trails updates. This is kind of where I'm throwing out, you know, possible use of trail funds. If we want, we have uh, various parks that need trail updates and upgrades and bridges to be replaced. So for walkability and quality of life, all of the park projects they've identified are usually more public safety, you know, related. Um, that's why uh, they have prioritized them as a one because um, they're more public safety related. Uh, playground replacements, there are two in here, um, so that price tag is $800,000. Lighting is $4.7 million. That is redoing the lights at Redbird Park, doing redoing the lights at uh, Harrington Park, the, the ball field lights, and replacing those with LEDs. Um, and there's another park in here, I believe, that had um, a big price tag in terms of lighting. Now, we are looking at grant funding, possibly, that could help, you know, some of those uh, uh, sports association or or our vendors that you know offer that kind of funding that maybe could help. Um, we'll certainly look at those what's available out there, but that's about 4.7 million collectively. Drainage improvements. Um, this would be riprap. I had to look up Google what riprap was, so I put a picture in case anybody else needs to know what riprap was. Um, so it's really the rocks to help with drainage. 
Um, have you ever been to Armstrong, walked around Armstrong after a heavy rain? It's like Lake Armstrong for a few days. Um, so, As opposed to Rick Rath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My thing. Uh, and I've been trained, and I've never heard of Rick Rath. Yeah. Okay. Um, lab property improvements, we're marking 150000 for that. Um, and then pretty much everything else in That's the priority the list. Plan. Hmm? That's just the master plan. That's not the anything. That's not the master plan. That is. Um, we missed some like three zeros. Mm -hmm. oh, that's the master plan. That is the master that plan. The okay, plan. we already have fifty thousand identified now for the master plan, so that would make we need another hundred to make it work. Um, and then pretty much everything else, other like signage, electrical infrastructure updates, security cameras, parking lots, um, comes about one point nine million. Wait a minute. So on, on the master plan for the lab property, it's, okay. so basically this this is a foregone issue. This one's coming. This one's going to be paid for no matter what we do. We're going to move forward. Yeah, kind of, well, I mean, we as a, as a council and everybody is committed to do whatever we got to do for the master plan. So that I look at this like this is a wish list. That's not a wish. Yes. I mean, that 150, it's, that's a foregone so number. That's, that would be a number. priority, right? Yes. So that's, so. that's going. Yeah. There's no thinking about this plan. Jennifer, does the 2.1 million in park buildings include the field house? No. This is just at our actual parks. The field house was separate. So this is actually in our parks. So again, these are, I'm just telling you what their priorities are. And I'm sorry that it's a, like I said, it's a pretty, pretty extensive. <coughs> um, here it's got, remind me again, the, the highlights. Okay, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Oh. So I have it n notated at the bottom, but yes, let me just speak that out loud. So if it has a gray highlight, it just means that um, they have been in communication with the DC DC board at some point about you know possible funding for certain projects. So I'm just highlighting those that um, we circle back with. You know, Mark can probably test. We've had conversations with the previous staff, city staff, and the economic development department, not the board. Okay. Just to clarify. Yeah. So we want to have another conversation to see if we can what we can get out of um, the DC DC if they can support any of these or not. In that case, I want to make another plug for District 5 because uh, Chris <laughs> Paris Park, I mean, it's, uh, I, mean, I don't know if there's been any improvements to that park. And that playground there. And then, it's been 11 years. Yeah. And so, yeah, if, that, if that's an option for possible bond funds, and I, you know, I'd like to see if, if any of those options brought forward. And if it's highlighted in yellow, I just highlighted it that, hey, it's a drip trail or a bridge-related project that, you know, if you want to move, up, you know, bond money, for example, that could go towards some trail current in our current parks, those are just highlighting those out. Okay. Do you want some more time to kind of look through some of the, some of the individual items? The land property improvement, that's just 150. You said that is the. That's a done deal, yeah. Okay. That's but that was the master, mm -hmm. master plan. Okay. What line number is that? I can't find it. 44, page 3 of 13. There it is. Oh, it doesn't, I was looking for master plan. Yeah, the, that's uh, what I. This is the master plan. We have some other public safety related things like parks, weather monitor upgrades um, to upgrade the notifications, a new sound system for the uh, parks department, and a senior center wants to revamp, it's kind of in the other category, but wants to revamp um, marketing, revamp their name, kind of new signage on the building based on, you know, how they revamped it. Um, I know at District 1's meeting, they were talking about um, some concerns happening in the area, such as gunshots, and I know it was brought up about lights 
possibly having some type of detector on them. Uh, is that something that's incorporated in these prices? These are just basic lights. Yeah. Is that something that we're... I mean, if that's something, we can get some estimates and stuff, but that would not be included in this. Those are um, a lot of the newer lights nowadays. That's what I was sharing. Those, a lot of the newer lights actually have built-in sensors where they'll, they can send information to the police in terms of if they hear gunshots or even like weather and those types of things. But I'm sure part of you guys didn't break any of that. Here. We did not. I do recall a couple of years ago the police department brought forward a potential program for that very thing. And and what happened? It just, I think it just didn't get any support at the time. And um, when it comes to these kind of projects and all this, they do not have a funding source of their own. So keep that in mind, um, unless we can get some from grants or perhaps DCUBC. Okay, moving on to traffic operations. Um, traffic operations. Currently, um, when we had red light cameras, predominantly his his traffic needs were covered by red light funding. But since that has <laughs> gone away, all of what he can absorb within his operational budget is what we're able to do. So these are um, projects that are he needs in order to upgrade his, um, his 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 items. So upgrade school zone system that would be top priority for. For them, um, that's a one-time cost of $422,000 to upgrade all the school zone. Um, emergency vehicle preemption, um, this is something that we've spread out over the five years. He wants to talk. <laughs> yeah, all those numbers include 10 years of service, so that's for 10 years after everything's installed. Well, starting first year being first in 10 years. So emergency vehicle preemption, that allows so when a uh, police or a fire is dispatched, they can go safely through the intersection because it, it uh, pretty much syncs up with the signal and that way they can go in freely without their hesitation or having an accident in the, in the intersection. Um, vehicle detection equipment, that's 1.2 million over five years. And can you, Mr. John, say what that is specifically? Well, currently we have video detection at every intersection. What that allows the intersection to do is be what's called fully actuated. It basically, if it sees two cars, it gives enough green time for two cars. If it sees 10, it gives enough for 10, depending on what the timing maxes out at. When that doesn't work, it gives, it maxes out if there's one car or 20. So let's say you're traveling down Wheatland and you stop at Lincoln. There's no car there. That's because the cameras fail. It has to service that direction regardless, just in case there is a car there. But I um, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, but I knew about this in 2016. This would be the eighth year I brought it up. So nobody wanted to give me the money. So that's where we're at now. So all public safety, for sure. Traffic operations, IT infrastructure upgrades, 3.8 million over five years, including um, utility funding, um, can pitch in for that. So that's updating his IT infrastructure to the signals, to the pump stations, and yes. That's completing it, not and that's time add into our water waste yeah. into the rest into the system. Are these in your priority, or is this just a compilation putting things together? What would you put as number one and number two? Why not him ask you? Mr. Well, Mr. Finch, well, since I have to, you ask him? Since I have to maintain it all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> emergency vehicle preemption equipment saves lives. So that would be, a, to me, that would be above the school zone stuff because I can make the school zone stuff duct tape and bang a wire for another year. But it's not use those words. <laughs> no, I'm using those words. The video detection will get everybody phone calls from people. Why am I stopping? Why is this arrow not staying green long enough? Why is it, you know? We just went through that. Yeah, everybody's phone will start ringing soon, just letting you know because of that. Because I knew it was going out in 2016, the manufacturer told me that it would be obsolete by now. So I brought it up, but anyway. The IT infrastructure, I've got 31,000 feet of fiber already traveling between intersections and facilities. That'll finish out all my stuff with fiber. I can get rid of the old radios and cellular stuff that I have and tie Matt's water system into the network also. Can you look on page five or 13? You would just, uh, oh, you would I didn't answer your question. The emergency vehicle preemption would be my first priority. Okay. So this, that's number one, the vehicle detection would be number two, if I hear you right. If you want your phone not to ring, but for school zones, I'd pick that second and then video for third. Oh, okay. okay. And again, these are listed on page five. Um, 
and it'll show you how it's broke, how he's planning to break it out um, over the next five years. So these are not costs that would be incurred in the very first year. Um, so you can see, like for example, the emergency vehicle preemption. If we do it over the next five years, it would be um, so that's row eighty. Sorry, no row eighty-two. Um, it would be one hundred nineteen thousand per year for the next five years to change out those intersections. Of course. <laughs> Well, it goes down, yeah, 76,000 from 29. Well, there's an odd number of intersections. I'm doing as much as I can <coughs> at the end of the last because there's less intersections to do. Jennifer, on line 70, 78, 78, 78, 78. the first one for the fire station, I didn't know that was in there. That, that's not a necessity. Okay. I put, I put them all down, so. <laughs> well, 35 grand we're gonna have to spend. So, line 77. Yeah, I can do it with 500 bucks with regular signs instead of the ones. That's for four signs, two in each direction that are edge lit, that, that blink at you all the time. Because nobody does 40, you can't believe them anyway, so they're, you know, for the fire station. It just brings more attention that there's a fire station there, but they're 36 inch signs anyway. I think, though, with that, with <coughs> I mean, we can have an offline conversation. Obviously, that's not enough, but I know that my conversation with the fire department is they're looking for a sure. traffic control yeah. light they want it. at yeah. the new station. Yeah, because they, they're it's difficult for them to cross there. Yeah, yeah, get in and out. So that's really what that is? I think that's what that's supposed to be. Um, I got them it's all, yeah, it, it's for a sign in the median each direction, a sign on the roadside each direction that it's solar powered and it's edge lit with yellow LEDs. That light has got the fire truck on. It just brings attention that there's a fire station. And it's about 350 feet in advance in each direction of the fire station. So they'll see it on a football field ahead of the fire station. Point being, that should have been in the design thing in the first place. Yeah, it wasn't in the plans originally. It should have been. But it should have been. I didn't get asked. So enough. Enough. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. And, and so I, I wanted to make sure because. Yeah, Steve, you know, over five years time, but, but you're saying that all these are 10 year, yes, 10 year life projects. Yes. Well, the warranty from day one would be 10 years. I made sure to get the most warranty I could out of all of them. Because that, that's the issue I have now. A lot of it's out of warranty and it was all installed at the same time. So everything's starting to go out at one time. Because when we had red light funding, I was able to buy everything over two years. And now I, I just have nothing to maintain one or two at a time. And just a few other items um, may not necessarily be on the high of his list, but you know, some control equipment, some new signage, server, relocating the server that's here at City Hall down to the service center. That's traffic related, um, audible uh, pedestrian signals, replacing all of those. Um, so all of that together, about 468,000. You mentioned the school zone and it's one of the challenges that the city administration is dealing with. There's multiple different conversations. So the police department's having a school conversation with the school district about them handling all the school zone type stuff, including the crossing guards and all that type stuff. And you probably didn't even know that. So that's some internal stuff that we have to work out still. Matt, we got work to do. Yes, sir. Well, good job. Make it yeah. all so uh, we'll have to talk about that when they fund it or whatever, so. Okay. Uh, moving on to public works. Um, so that's really page four and five. Um, so a lot of the public works items, they do have other funding sources, um, whether it's utility fund or um, sanitation fund for alley projects or it's stormwater fees for drainage projects. So um, out of the 78 million, 41 million, again, includes the bond projects that are remaining, so near Ridge Road and the service center um, are included in that 41 million total. It also includes 11 million in there for AMI. Um, so the other needs, though, however, with public works, so the fire station number two needs a new HVAC, um, and that's about $76,000. The fuel pumps at the service center, so we have uh, fuel pumps that are in ground, and they have been um, operational since 1987, 1986, something like that. Um, they have been still, you know, passing the annual inspection they have to do with the environment, you know, to ensure there's no leaks and anything like that happening in the ground. But, you know, we're going to be running out of um, the useful life of, of those. We're actually past um, the useful life of those fuel pumps. So they want to um, take them out of the ground and put above ground. 
um, fuel tanks. So <coughs> the idea was to do this in conjunction when we did the service center renovation, but since that has been delayed, um, that obviously does not happen. So this um, could be a standalone project. And at today's uh, rates, it's about 300000 to do that. So that would be um, a high priority. Um, some utility projects, so they want to do an aerial pipeline assessment, so about 100000 This is like a one-time um, study, if you will, to assess all of our aerial pipelines to identify, you know, what, you know, needs to be uh, addressed and replaced. Um, it's time for them to do another water wastewater master plan um, for 200000 so that will be able for them to map out for the next so many years of what priorities um, of utility projects that they need to do. Um, a loop line at the fire station one. So currently the water in that Wait, area. Hold on, what? Yes. Did you say 89 for the underground fuel pump? Yeah, I think we, it was installed in 1986, 87. Sounds all right. right. I think 87 was built. Well, in 2024, yes. they have not been compromised. They have not been. They, 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 they do their annual inspections to ensure that, and they have yet to be uncompromised. So, but it's the, what's that? The urgency okay. to. Yeah, would go. Yeah. <laughs> and some of this can be also offset by some utility funding or sanitation funds since, you know, we have staff and vehicles from those uh, funding sources that, you know, obviously use the fuel. So, um, yes. Uh, loop line at the fire station one. So um, there is a, a, a dead um, end, and he um, can talk to that. <laughs> so in uh, the original design for the fire station, uh, the water line crosses Camp Wisdom, goes to the fire station. It feeds their fire suppression system, and then there is one fire hydrant. But there is no looping of that water line, which usually we would not allow. Um, this one got past us, and so we are looking to continue that pipeline uh, and tie it into Lornwood Nursing Home. So we can also add additional fire hydrants. There's uh, several options we have, and it will by far improve circulation and uh, capacity, water capacity, volume. So this is another must-have, not a dream. Well, it's not an immediate must-have, but it's very important. It should have been there. It should have been there, yes. Okay. But Matt, there's a number of dead-end lines throughout there the are, city, there right? Are. And that's where, like, doing the the water master plan would yes. help us identify all of those so that we can look at it yes. for a collective approach. Yes. Um, there are another variety of utility projects that have already been started from a design standpoint. So um, this would be moving those into construction. For example, the third phase of the Greenbrier States um, area, Copper Hill um, pipeline improvements. Um, let's see, some uh, East Freeman, some uh, wastewater pipeline replacements, um, a siphon replacement. So that all kind of fits under the, um, the various projects of about 4.7 million. And those have already been designed, so it would be just uh, approving the funding to get them constructed. Pipe bursting is an annual program. Um, the uh, capacity currently is about one million every year. So for the next five years, um, five million, that's been a, a very uh, well-received and um, very useful program to improve our wastewater pipes to do pipe bursting. Um, we don't have any future uh, identified drainage project at this time, so this is more like a, just an ear, earmark. So drainage assessments, they need to you know, assess our current drainage and erosion and everything to see, again, to identify what needs to be done and then when. So they need to do a master plan. We don't have a drainage master plan currently. And then whatever improvements that may be identified through those assessments. So we're estimating about 1.4 million over the next five years that fall into assessments, master plan improvements. Same thing with drainage, erosion, bridges, um, 800000 over the next five years. These would be stormwater related projects. And then sidewalk improvements, um, about 550000 over the next five years. We try to target an area every year and try to get CDBG funding um, every other year for um, areas in that, um, in that CDBG area to do uh, ADA improvements to sidewalks. That's pretty much everything Public Works related for priority ones. So for just Jeff Brown, yes. <laughs> yeah, on, on the, on the sidewalk improvements, well, we, we used to have an in-house concrete crew, and is that for largely using, or is this? They, I will say the street division is understaffed. You know, they've had hard to fill positions, so they don't really have the manpower to do as much as they used to. 
this summer. So, a question, Jennifer. Everything we've looked at comes to $78 million. Yes. But remember, you got like a $20 million police station in that total, so some things right. you can but, probably take off. Me looking at, like here in, in the previous slide, some of these expenses over a duration of extended periods of years. So if you were to decremate like that, 800000 is over five years. Shouldn't that, for what we're considering, be 800000 divided by five? And that should be the money we're considering versus considering 800000 well, $78 million, as I showed, is still FY25. Is there, yeah, but like yeah. for, I'm just saying, some of yes. the stuff that we're talking about is not an expenditure in FY25. Well, it would be an like expenditure in 25 and 26 and 27 and 28. And That's 29. what I'm saying. So yeah. the 78 million is actually less than what we're talking about. Because like the next to last line, $800,000 to be spent over five years. You divide 800,000 by five is what we're really looking at to be spent in fiscal year 25. No, because what I did when we, um, it's hard to tell, but for example, let me give you. Jennifer, if I can jump in for a second. Mayor, to your point though, I think one of the things that I would recommend to council is like, for instance, I understand exactly what you're saying. We have not done a lot of the planning that we should be doing to really lay out when this stuff is going to be done, right? So, for instance, that water master plan would then tell us what the real issues are, and then over a 15-year period, which is where I'm really hoping that I can take us, right? And we can say, okay, this year we're going to spend this, this year we're going to spend that, and it's all going to be documented. There's no way I would recommend you doing the fuel pumps without planning at least the first where the service center is going to be because you don't want to ever do it twice, right? It's that type of stuff, even the drainage type stuff, right? We can do a drainage master plan that really looks at what's going on, and then we can plan out over the years. We can do the same for parks. We can do the same for a lot of this stuff. And so, you know, based on what I'm seeing here today, and I've gone through this a couple of different times, I think one of the things I'd recommend to council is Maybe we focus on planning for 25 and really get real data and details for you guys to make informed decisions in the future. And that's what I'm thinking is because the $78 million, looking at the number of projects you put up here, some of them are extending over five years, some of them are X number of years, that $78 million sticker shock could be overstated by maybe well, a couple, three million. I will say, like if you look at row on page five, um, 85 through 88, I labeled them as ongoing because they're ongoing things, but it already has the annual amount in there, 1 million or 50,000 or 200,000 and spread out over the five years. So actually it's really the 78 million right, still so comes to that stuff. That's my curiosity. Yeah. Where is the drainage erosion the bridge is 800,000 for five years? What line number is that? That is, um, 87 on page five. So for FY25, it'd be 200,000. For FY26, 150. I mean, the total value. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, I mean, it's broken out, and that's where I got my subtotal. Okay. So I'm see, sorry. This now answers my question. Yes. Yes. So that it's not $800,000 in that $78 million, which is what I was concerned about. Because now the spreadsheet decrement or increments that $800,000 yes. over five years, which that doesn't tell me. But it does. So there's the answer to my question. Right out of space. <laughs> no, it, it's yeah. just like I'm yeah. thinking if that's five years, then it's really not 800,000 we're playing with. It's something less. But really, if this slide were to demonstrate what we're looking at in FY25, that 800,000 should be decorated by 200,000. It should be 600,000. Yeah. Or should, I'm sorry, it should be 200,000 instead yes. of 800,000. Yes. But there it is. Okay. That's the total value over the five years. Doubles in the details. Okay. So that's everything from a one perspective. Of course, there's more, you know, and you can read that um, later. But the next section we're going into is talking about funding strategy. So you all need a break, stretch. Uh, we have while. been here for almost two hours. Do you want to take a quick break? Until next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Take take as short a break as possible. Come on back. Okay. Oh, time is seven forty-four.
Yes. Time stamp is uh, yep, on air. Just came back on. We're green light all the way to go. Time stamp 715. Okay. Uh, before we really get into funding strategies, actually, um, there's a lot of information that's just been thrown at you and a lot of things to consider. Um, certainly, when we uh, leave tonight, want to walk away that you know we've been able to come to you know get some kind of direction or consensus of, of maybe narrowing down some of these uh, project types and projects. So what I would like y'all to do is do a priority exercise. You've heard you know our needs and some um, from the, the staff kind of how they came up with their priorities. So we're going to try this. Hopefully, it works out. What we're going to do is start with small groups. Okay. So I want y'all to pair up or, you know, two to three, because then y'all can talk a little uh, more about, you know, talk about what, what's a priority that you've heard that you want us to definitely consider, kind of make your list, and then we'll come back together, kind of present, you know, what that is and kind of talk about that together. Okay? How much time for that? How about three minutes? Do you want that? Well, teacher, I think you should just group them together and tell okay, them. Hey, okay, we're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't play games real well. Oh, apparently. <laughs> Sorry. How about Greg and Mr. Joe pair yeah. up together? Oh, okay. Right. So, and we'll have <laughs> Ms., uh, Ms. Gooden and Ms. Jerry to okay. uh, group up together. If y'all need some extra papers, I've got some notes here. Um, how about Jeremy and um, Mr. McMurna and the mayor? kind of group up if possible and y'all just kind of go through that list i want you to write down what you've heard is your top priorities and kind of make that list okay are you going to give some parameters why don't you just why don't you just pick like just to try to keep it simple like maybe five based on everything that you've heard tell us what you think are five priorities that are high on your radar just to give us some direction and it's not those are project specific it could be project type Sure. And you know, I would like suggest building. I would suggest using for briefing rather than this puppy right here. Because these are the top priorities that have already been identified based on what the department has said on the spreadsheet. This is your list of look at that. That's my suggestion. Is it my Yes, that that's fine. Okay. Otherwise you'd be turning through this thing. Five minutes. Okay, till eight o'clock. Well, that time. Five items, five minutes. You're champions. Let's go. So, uh, if you need some extra paper, write on. Yes, just for you. Everything we've seen from that. And you say it's no need of doing the fuel cost if you can't do the new service. I, uh, you could say service in a plane or something or other. Okay. 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 That's not going to get done. Mm -hmm. you know, plan. Yeah, all right. All right. So the master plan would be evaluating what's going on, actually hiring a consultant, do an assessment, and that sort of thing. It wouldn't actually be doing that. Okay, so the assessment's Something else is probably not going to get There's another one that got Specific, but 
He said they were talking about something else. Council member and mayor is about halfway through, two minutes and 30 seconds. We're recording out of five. We have four to five. We're 80% through. That's because you're champions. The Council of Champions, baby. We should have given them more time, but we give them this more time. <laughs> what happens if that's a bit of a yeah. Under contract. One minute, one minute remaining. We didn't get to the video. One minute. One minute. One minute. One Five minutes are up. <laughs> From the night. Five minutes are up. Okay. So you smell this every day. We're ready. All right, y'all good? We're ready. Are you about How about I start at that end of the table? You want to designate your spokesperson. So why don't you tell us what your what your projects are and why? Um, Bill Hills. HVAC and roof replacement because you can't do one without the other. Uh, as far as police and fire, we're looking at uh, replacing the engine and replenishing the police fleet. So the fire engine. The four by the quint. And yes, the quint. And the uh, police patrol vehicles. Right. Okay. And then. Uh, Not the best of handwritings, but. As far as traffic operations, we're, as far as traffic operations, we're in the vehicle det detection equipment. Okay. And then the AMI. Does that, that vehicle detection include the preemption one, or is it the main one? Uh, it's the main one. Is that, is that the emergency vehicle detection? Is that what you mean? No. Okay. Not the number, the emergency one. Right. Yes, I do. Okay. 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 And I can record on like what wrong number that is That's John's for number quick two. access. Vehicle detection is John's number two. <coughs> All right, who would like to do it from the mayor? There goes. Yes, okay. <clears throat> Our number one is the police department building. Okay. 
Number two is AMI. Number three is the service center. Number four is the emergency vehicle preemption, which is different than the vehicle protection. And the last one is our water, wastewater master plan. You didn't have to buy clean on that? Pardon me? <laughs> 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 That was number six. I can't believe that. <laughs> Just <laughs> missed. <laughs> what, well, Greg? Who's your list, mate? <laughs> Jennifer, our number one was the uh, AMI. Number two is uh, drainage assessment, master plan improvement. Go back this way. Number three was HVAC, Bill House. Uh, number four, regional dispatch upgrades. And number five, police department. Police department building facility? Yes, yes. And then police. Okay, question, Mr. Stigman. Did you not say that it's highly likely? The HVAC for the field house is going to be paid for by the PC. And therefore, should we drop out of this? Well, I, I never said dropped out. And here's the reason I say that is because if it's one of your number one priorities, then it's easier for me to go to the DCEDC and say, hey, this is council's priority. Okay, so leave it in. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said so. We have three groups, right? Okay. We have three groups, right? Yes. So. So there's some there's some direction from here. Obviously, AMI that was universal. It's all three. Mm -hmm. yeah. Police department building was in two. Yeah. Yeah. Field house is in two. Some overlap, right, between vehicle detection and preemption. <laughs> um, it's not the same thing. No. It's not the same thing. No. The, no, the vehicle preemption is where the, the police and fire can stop a stoplight. And the vehicle detection is a camera that says, let's put it, let's load three cars go through the traffic light right now. And it's interesting that John said, if the camera fails, it defaults to a maximum of 20. That I didn't know until tonight. The reason I, I picked uh, the detection over the uh, the other one. Preemption. Preemption. I, yeah, I can't see it. Um, is, I don't know Duncanville's policy, but in Dallas, we had to come to a complete stop at every intersection, no matter what whether it's green or not. Because people are not paying attention. They're I don't know our policy is yeah. first responders. I don't mean they're but I've seen them not careful. stop. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pull your horn, slow down, and get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> some of you will scare some of them. <laughs> don't run for that. So preemption, detection, and vehicle detection. Yeah, two, two separate. Mm -hmm. This is emergency vehicles only, and then this is just that have to do with the, the traffic, the traffic count, the signals, and the controls, and the timing. <clears throat> we picked that because I, John said that's his number one. Yeah, John said that was his, so he followed up with him. <clears throat> so we only agreed on one? Well, no, so you have three with AMI, two with police building, two with field house. So if you were going to say those are your priorities, right? AMI, police building, and field house, which that's certainly doable. But then you have a water master plan and a drainage master plan, which each have one. You know, one is technically drinking water, one is drainage, but you might be able to combine those two separate documents, but an exercise to do that, right? 
And it looks like service center one, traffic control one, regional dispatch one. <clears throat> so maybe of those, we have clear direction on like three. What if we took these others where, let's have a conversation about some of those and, and where you stand um, so that we can get some clear direction. You know, the regional dispatch, I feel like the CAD system, that's that's going to move forward. The regional dispatch in, in terms of the new facility, that's going to be something outside of specifically our capital plan. So I'm not, I, I'm not so sure that you should spend a lot of time worrying about that. Now, like the two vehicle things, like the preemption detection and the vehicle detection, that's definitely something that is just up to the city. Um, the drainage and the water master plans is up to the city. The service center is up to the city. So I think that's all of them, right? Mm -hmm. And police building. And the equipment, police vehicles yes. and fire vehicles, right? Vehicles, police, and fire. Yeah. These planning tools are definitely very important and will happen because that paves the way for making well, a plan. And plus, we're doing the comp plan, right? Yes. So, um, you know, those are definitely something you could combine planning documents if you wanted to comp plan, water master plan, drainage master plan, if that made sense mm -hmm. to everybody. You could designate that yeah. as a focused area yes. that includes, yeah. right? So how much, because, like the, the, you know, this does confirm, <coughs> when you look at our current work plan, you look at the, the document that we got from a similar exercise that we did back in, what was it, November or December? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there anything, because there's a couple of new items here, but most of these items are what? Similar. Yeah, so, I mean, is there anything that's on that document that, that we don't have on here for 20, 2025? <laughs> I know with those exercises, they were kind of broader in right. nature, yeah, too, yeah. in knowing that we couldn't say that we were going to do this in the first year. We didn't even have, like, a facility assessment to know, yeah. you know, do we need a new library? Do we need a new police station? Do we need, you know, a little more broader? But these are definitely a lot more specific items. So those items were building needs assessment, which is underway now. Public safety, what I deemed a public safety operational needs, since you guys had combined them, police and fire separate, I mean, I would combine them. Question, because we we had a building needs assessment mm -hmm. from 2018, mm -hmm. right? This is, a, this is an update of... Right. Yeah. But that's really a 24. That'll be delivered to you before the 25 budget goes into place, right? Um, AMI, um, the capital improvement fund essentially, um, you know, and that's going to have to be a work in progress too, obviously, as we get more data from some of the other stuff. The downtown vision, the comprehensive plan that we've kind of talked about, um, and some of these planning tools, so that includes a lot of that. Uh, that could also be, what I would tell you, is the active transportation plans. Uh, <clears throat> we, I've used those before, those active transportation planning grants to actually fund growth node studies and so that's something that we could look at but you know that doesn't necessarily have to be a capital improvement specifically that's more of a planning type tool we can even list that under the planning documents and then the bond projects right, was the last one the prop a b c and d and the, the biggest questionable one that's out there right is the service center <clears throat> just because there's not enough funds to really do what probably needs to be done for the service center <clears throat> So it sounds like there's four main priorities right now. The AMI, the police building, the field house, these planning documents, the tools that include the water, the drainage, you could say the comp plan. And then you have smaller projects, which would be like the vehicle stuff, the uh, detection, uh, the traffic control. Vehicles is ongoing operations, um, but we do list those, right? And then... <laughs> The service center. So if you wanted capital projects as you look ahead to 25, you could say the five would be AMI, the police building, the field house, the planning documents, and the service center. That made sense. 
without consensus. So, service center, I know we, elephant in the room, right? The service center and then kind of crickets. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are there any, I mean, I, I, I talked about funding strategies yet, but are there any options available to us to even consider at this point? Well, that's what I was saying earlier for funding options. I think the potential, the, the, the solutions that David and I have been meeting with in terms of funding, right? $20 million loan, not a bond. I want to be very clear. It's not a bond, right? $20 million that would do the AMI and also would make up the difference essentially in what we're missing to do the new service center. Um, that could be a loan against that project, the AMI slash service center project. And we floated that idea about the service center being part of that. And they said, absolutely, that we can do that. The nice thing is it's not a bond. Now it's a loan, city, a general obligation loan that the city would take on. So it's a GO loan instead of a GO bond? Correct. But it's not a CO bond either? No. And the other thing is, you know, there's always the question because for the bylaws of the DCDDC, Maybe they could help with, with some of that debt. They could do that because G the DCEDC can fund uh, not only city facilities, but can fund city operations. So is this loan we're borrowing from ourselves or we're no. borrowing from an external financial institution? An external financial institution, but it would not be a bond. Okay. Yes. And it would not be subject to voter approval? Correct. Because I recall that the state legislature is still fighting about the certificates of obligation and the general obligation bond. It was defeated in the last session, in the 88th session. They, the, the subject of doing away with the certificate of obligation, which would not allow the city to issue a CO without going to voter approval, was defeated. It never came up in terms of the vote. But if somebody wants to still play with that, that's you know a state representative or a state senator, it could come up in the 89th. Sure. We should do it fast. <laughs> that's what I'm, so that's what I'm saying. Rather than counting that possible prohibition, which would hamper us and, and handcuff us, do a loan against a third party, an outside third party financial institution would be more efficient right. and expedient than looking at a CO or a GO. Right. Yeah. And we're still exploring some of that stuff. And it, it sounds like there's pretty reasonable rates and everything right now. Yeah, four you know, and a we'll quarter, be, four and a quarter, five and a half. Do you remember what that rate was? It was, it actually wasn't bad. I want to no, say it was what? three, yeah, three and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah, it yeah. wasn't bad because of the jump on it. Go on it. Need five bucks? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Earn, earn this money. Here's five bucks. So, are, I mean, are you, is this, are you recommending that we consider that option? Or I want to get more detail. I'm sharing conversations that we're having right now, not ready to make that recommendation because I'm still getting details. I would never recommend something unless I know specifically that we're going to be good to go with that. Yeah, because in another part of my life at the moment, we're, I've got over $5 million in debt that I'm looking to refinance for somebody else. And I went up to some financial institutions, we're at four and a half, and they said, don't move. We can't touch you at four and a half. Anything we would do to refinance today, you're going to be paying more than four and a half. So if, you, every, if we can get anything four and a half or lower, we're in really good shape right now. Now, like the police building, right? There was, you know, two people or two groups uh, supported that. If that's one of the priorities, that's probably going to have to be a bond. Yep. You know, that's more significant. And we'll have more details. I'm confident we'll have more details <laughs> once we do the operational analysis because what I would tell you is I've also been having conversations with Cedar Hill uh, and DeSoto specifically and also Lancaster, but about where the strategic locations of those public uh, safety facilities go because Matrix Consulting did those also. And so they're very excited because there's discussion about some additional public safety buildings in those other cities and knowing that we're doing one now too, maybe there's some sweet spots that could help service instead of just one municipality taking on that full responsibility. Now, just for some background, and these folks will remember, but maybe they won't. Uh, we were permitted to go to 21.6 million 
the last bond in 2018 because of our rating and the fact that we could go to 21.6 million without decreasing taxes. That was our cap. You can't go beyond 21.6. So if we're looking at a, <coughs> at a bond for two major facilities in excess of 20 million, you're, probably, you're very likely looking at a tax increase. So that's going to be a parameter you got to it could be a tug and a pull yeah. in terms of getting that in front of the voters. Well, and we would bring all that back to you in terms of the average assessed value and what the proposed increase would be and everything else. That's why doing the AMI through a non-bond source yep. may be advantageous, right? And then that way we're able to, when we know more information about the needs of the police facility, reserve the bonding for that if needed. Yeah. And along that way, because what is it? It's, it's all revenue issue. Mm -hmm. At least AMI sort of pays for its mm -hmm. sell. Mm -hmm. It's like how do we find other opportunities that will pay for itself? Well, that's uh, we started the budget meetings and I challenged the police department to find an additional five hundred thousand dollars. So don't speak. No, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> no, do speak. <laughs> strategies that he's already kind of alluded to because one of the questions was I guess what you just said about you know what that might look like if we were to go out with the bond again um, so I've ran some kind of scenarios just to give you kind of an idea so just to show you here's the 10-year uh, tax rate history we've had very little um, the blue is the interest in sinking aka the debt portion of your tax rate the, the red is what's operations that owe in it okay so on average from the last 10 years I mean our debt portion that goes towards paying debt has been about six to eight percent of the total tax rate okay um, Per the, the most recent uh, Senate bill, the one with that, that caps us at three and a half percent, that's specific to the operations only. So the debt portion is not even a factor into the cap in terms of the rate that you set. Um, so average single family residence taxable value. Our current average um, per Dallas County or Dallas Central Appraisal District um, in this previous year is 222,000. Okay, our current tax rate is 0 0.64, 6034. So the city paid portion of uh, the average uh, bill was uh, $1,400, okay? So if we, um, the Dallas uh, Central Appraisal District does not um, have the assessments out yet in terms of what the values are going to be. They predict um, maybe a single digit increase, but over the last five years, on average, it's been about 10% of an increase. So I kind of ran two different scenarios. So if they come back to us and say, the taxable value um, increases by 5%, um, this is approximately what that rate might look like, and that would be a difference of $47 added to the average um, um, homeowner. Um, if they come back and say it's a 10% you know, increase in total taxable value, this is what that average would look like. This is maybe what the tax rate would look like. Um, and again, $47 would be what um, the average homeowner, the impact is. So... Talking about debt, okay, so um, that 5%, 10%, this is what that total value would look like with the 5% increase. Again, what that rate might look like, which gives us a revenue of 24 million. If we add one cent to the debt portion of that rate, this is what that tax rate could look like, which would generate another approximately 383,000. When you consider the 10% incre increase and in how the math worked um, with the same um, kind of scenario, adding a, a, a cent to the debt rate, it generates about 400000 okay? Um, and so that uh, average increase to the average homeowner um, from the current would be another $70, you know, approximately to the average homeowner if we were to raise the rate by, say, a cent, or, uh, yeah, one cent. So going to four cents, for example, um, that would be kind of what the tax rate would look like. That would generate 1.5 million. Um, and on the 10% market value increase there, um, it would generate about 1.6 million. Our current uh, debt payment that we make is about 1.5 million every year to pay back our 21 million. So say if we had another $20 million bond, you can anticipate maybe about another 1.1 million in terms of a debt payment 
you know, to pay that back. To give you, again, kind of the idea. Um, so the average uh, increase to um, a resident from the current value, if we were to go up four cents, for example, that would be the annual impact to the average homeowner, about $187. Just to kind of give you a perspective. If we don't change the rate from on the operations of um, side. If we weren't, if we if we were to go for the full three and a half percent, that would go towards operation maintenance and, uh, and increase the debt portion of the rate. You know, that's what you know it both could possibly look like. Exceed the voter approval rate. Well, the voter approval rate is only so when we set the rate, we're looking at the operation and maintenance portion of the rate. Okay, so you have that, um, and um, so a no new so revenue rate. Sixty nine. We can take four off that, but sixty five. But that point sixty five is still above point sixty three. That is great. So this is the voter approval rate without making any changes. Okay. So if we were to add a cent to the debt rate, that would be this number right here. Which yes, it looks like it's over the voter approval rate, but the debt portion of your rate does not count in the three and a half percent. So if it's yes. for the table, I understand. When would we when would we have to or not have to go to the voters to touch our tax rate? So Based on what you're, on this on these scenarios, when would we go to the voters for approval for a tax rate, or when can we stay below so we not have to go to the voters? So when we find out number one, obviously what our values are going to be, and then the the calculation comes into play of what is our no new revenue rate. So that is the rate that is calculated based on if we're going to generate the exact same amount of revenue that we received. This is the rate, okay, that you would set. So the debt portion. You know, does not is not capped by the three and a half percent. Only the operation and maintenance portion of the rate is what's um, capped to that three and a half percent. So, you know, as we looking at what the values actually are, and if we're going down the road, say, doing another bond election, you know, and we need to support that bond by tax revenue, and these are the kind of discussions that we would have to have to know what rate we're going to be comfortable with setting. So if we need to generate so much more revenue without impacting the homeowner, then that's going to come off the operation and maintenance side of the house, you know, that, which is going to lower, you know, money that goes into the general fund to pay for salaries and police and fire and all those other things. Um, or, you know, consider raising the rates in order to be able to capture that repayment, that debt portion. So the bottom line is you really don't know what that rate would be until we get some more pro rata information. True. But just trying to give you a scenario where you all have to like. keep in mind that once we mess with this voter approval rate, the no new revenue rate, you may end up coming up with a bond dollar amount that's going to require the voters to approve it and to approve a tax increase, which is going to be a hot political potato. Yeah. Hopefully we present you solutions so that that's not on the table. Right, but that's that's the cost. I mean, it needs to be out on the table that we understand there's the possibility. You have to consider where do we go, how much do we go for, and whether we are going to ask for voters to increase the tax rate. I think the other thing that we've got to work on, and Jennifer, you and I can work on it, but <clears throat> what I'm seeing from somebody who's going through the process of buying a house right now, the market value is significantly higher than oh, yeah. the assessed the value, value, right? Yeah. And so as those adjustments are made, that may equate to tax increases, even with that, the tax rate for the city doesn't change, right? And so we also need to be cognizant of that for the average taxpayer. If those reassessments are done, what that impact of that tax looks like, even if we don't change anything in terms of the revenue that we're getting. And so we'll run scenarios as we go through oh, the budget process for you. At that, this point, kind of the best guess Based on what we've seen historically in terms of what's been, you know, what the increases are, this is, you know, a, a calculation guess based on a scenario. Wait a minute. It's just giving the idea. If we were to go down the debt road, and you know, we would have to have those conversations of how much are you willing to pass along to the citizens? How much are we willing to, you know, reduce back on our end so it doesn't impact the citizens? But that's just. So I'm thinking from Richard's perspective and yours as well. <clears throat> If we do a bond and we do a loan, we now have debt service from two different sources. Okay. So that debt service is going to take on two different. It's going to take on a life of its own in terms of how we service that debt from funds. But that's where we also have to be strategic, even in terms of timing, right? If we can see that likely the the total taxable values are increasing, right, 
and we really start to because we've done our homework and we've done our planning and we think that this is coming online here and then maybe we do a, a bond anticipation note at first and it's not a full bond right and then we do these things and we stagger it out so that we start to plan for it we can start to plan for <coughs> absorbing more of that so that that cost is not packed on is passed on to the taxpayers but that's where that's where we get into multi-year budgeting, which I can't wait to do. <laughs> so again, not suggesting, not necessarily recommending this approach, but just giving you an idea. If you went down this road in this fashion, kind of what the average, the impact would look like. And this is probably a crazy question, but if we went down this road, that would include the upgrades for AMI. Or no, you said you can have to find a way. But if just in case we get AMI, then that's an increase, possible increase on water bill because it would be accurately accounting for the water usage. And then we will be asking the citizens to pay an additional increase on taxes. Not well. necessarily that's for AMI since that's utility fund. This is more uh, general fund more general type backed fund. projects like buildings. But, but to right. your but point, I know what you're saying. We so want to charge them yeah. We'll show you because that's the way I've always done it is actually creating a chart for the average homeowner. This, if the rate is this, this is what they're going to pay in that. If the utility bill is this, this is what they're going to pay in that. So you get a full picture based on the value of that home or the average, right? Because I can't do it for every single house, mm -hmm. but you're going to get an idea of this is the true net impact to the resident. We're just not there yet. That's what I was asking. Yeah. Okay. So again, just just <clears throat> scenarios, just to kind of give you an idea. Um, Y'all seen this chart before? I'm not going to go into too too much details, but I showed this to you last year, and this is just some debt comparisons to show how we are in our our cities that we uh, relate to in terms of how much our debt capacity is. We're very low. Um, which is not a bad thing. As you can see, these other cities have a heftier amount of debt that they do take on. So um, their tax-supported debt is a lot higher per capita, for example. Our financial policy says we want to limit to not exceed 1000 um, per capita. So currently, we're about 450 per capita is what our debt you know, I is. I need to ask you a question. Yes. It's deep. Uh, and if it's too deep, tell me to shut up and go away. It's fine, really. But... I know financial institutions come up with a calculation of an index of a debt service ratio in terms of where the writer is going to say go, no go, green light on a loan, particular on dollar amount. And if that DSR is like 0.25, that's the ceiling. Anything below 0.25 in the underwriter can say green light. Does GASB have that same criteria in terms of if we go for a commercial loan? Does GASB have anything in its rules in terms of what that DSR can be for a municipality? And if that's too deep, tell me, go away, do it later. Uh, <clears throat> no, that's a great question. I think uh, in terms of GASB specifically, I don't know if the there is a ratio by comparison. Um, the thing that we would be looking at is how <clears throat> our current financial position puts us with the calculations that will be made by the ratings agencies. So when we got to the point where we were ready to go out for any bond or any loan, we would want to get an updated rating. Well, we would want to have an updated ratings call with the Standard & Poor's, the Moody's, the Fitch. Right. Um, and so we would... <clears throat> certainly want to make sure that we're uh, up to date on the uh, on the act for reporting uh, but I guess long answer to a short question is is really uh, the the I guess the standard is normally by the financial institution versus what we what would be in uh, for Gatsby I haven't really seen anything in my experience with going out to bond council that's beyond that's right, that's the, right. Uh, yeah that's so right. in terms of, in terms of the bonds that i've had experience going out for it's a combination of the financial institution information as well as what comes back from the analysts assigned to us from the ratings agency it's, it's right i'm just saying it's quite possible that the underwriters from a commercial institution will impose that 0.25 psr they just will because that's what they're playing with today 
And if there's anything more stringent in the GASB that we would have to deal with, that would be the question. Or if GASB says we really don't care, it's only going to be based on the bond rating from the from you know standard reports and so forth. So that that's really the question is is that the, the, where's that DSR going to play? If it's not, that's going to be okay. And just knowing you, the underwriters are looking at that 0.25. They won't they won't touch you if you're over 0.25. They are, but a lot of the financial institutions, especially the ones that loan money to municipalities, right? They're looking at so much more than just right, that, that, right? Is, they're looking at the assets. They're looking at um, so many other things that, okay. yeah. And that's really the, yeah. the essence of my question, yeah. <clears throat> so I think I think the, the way that the numbers appear to be trending, I mean, certainly we have another audit and uh, some other things to undertake. But between that, some of the economic outlook that's out there, though, those things would definitely feed into Duncanville having a good story to tell yeah. once, you know, once we get to that point. Okay. What's her updated rating? Double A2. What's her? Yes. Yeah, double A2. Mm -hmm. So we're in good shape. So, yeah, they, they've held us, they've held us as stable. Um, and they will update as, I mean, certainly they just got 22 as they get 23, then will get updated from there, but I don't anticipate any downgrade at the very least. I'm, I'm anticipating stable, um, and you know, hopefully, I'll, hopefully, go from there. So, general fund balance that's one another source that you know we could tap into for some of these projects. So, taking the ending fund balance of uh, 22 16 million. Um, adding in our unaudited numbers at this point of what revenue we received, what expenses we made, will give us a fund balance of about 21 million at this point. Um, our current reserve, which is the which is the minimum reserve of 60 days, it can certainly go up from there. Previous city managers have had you know 75 days, kind of that target, but um, which is roughly 20 percent. This is roughly 16 percent of our operational expenses. Um, what we definitely want to have on hand is six million, but. Above and beyond that reserve, you know, amount available um, potentially is 14 million. Just on the reserve required amount, that is one thing I will be bringing to the council at some point in time. I'm used to having policies <laughs> that the council has reviewed and, and considered and adopted relative to that and a whole variety of other fiscal things. So I know our priority has been the audits, but Richard and I have had some questions, our conversations about updating some of those policies and bringing those to council so that those are recorded <coughs> so that it gives clear direction to staff not only now but for 20 30 years into the future so well, just so you know practice <coughs> if we take whatever the city manager deems Boy, that's appropriate. a bad practice that didn't work out so good a couple of years ago did it so <laughs> if the city manager says we need 75 days we go okay you need 75 days but it's never been codified in terms of policy, we, we would accept that in terms of recommendation made to council, that's the way it's going to run it. So if you want that black and white, yeah. it'll be there. There's some best practices that we can follow. Yeah. Yeah. So questions? Just kind of giving Another really weird question, but I'm thinking about all these investments we got, all these CDs we got. Can we, can we liquidate those, those instead of getting a loan? Well, that's included in the fourteen million, right? The CDs and everything, everything that's invested. So it's that wouldn't be over cash and investments. Yeah, that's cash. That's a cash and investments. Yeah. Okay. So. So to answer your question, sure, we could. We could liquidate some of those investments. Right. Yeah. investments. <clears throat> but if we're giving five percent interest on a CD and we're only paying three percent on a loan, right? That's the stuff we have to look at. Yeah. 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 Okay. So just kind of keeping in mind that you know you do have some one time. No reserve that you know we could tap into as well as an option. Um, kind of utility fund balance. So historically, we've um, we've out of the utility fund have transferred five million that goes towards CFD projects. Now we have not had any debt for quite some time in the utility fund. Um, we're projecting revenue, you know, about five percent every year since we have that five-year uh, rate um, increase ordinance in play. So that goes throughout uh, 27. And when we did have that conversation. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. I'm sorry. So expenses, I'm assuming kind of like two to three and a half percent. 
um, and a continued five million in a transfer into the CIP. Um, the rate model that we adopted in 23 kind of assumed when we had the conversation that it was gonna be a hybrid approach. We were gonna consider some debt and consider cash. Um, obviously haven't gone down that road to do, you know, to go anywhere further with the debt on the revenue bond, but I shall show this to say, you know, looking over time without making any, uh, I guess, having a revenue bond out there to cover our CIP needs, um, the fund does continue to grow because it's not going towards um, any debt. So we have the capacity if we wanted to go down that road for um, revenue bond for uh, water, wastewater type projects, we can certainly take that on with the utility uh, fund because we've uh, kind of made that assumption with the rate model that we passed. And that's also uh, where any AMI that we had, you know, reserved was sitting within the, um, the fund balance of the utility fund, so. And just kind of give you a snapshot of kind of where we're at with the utility fund. So same scenario as a general fund, kind of what our ending working capital is, um, on an audited balance of 15 million, keeping a 60 day reserve, leaves us about 11 million, you know, kind of above and beyond the 60 days, if that's the target that is. So kind of keeping that in mind as well. Um, so just kind of in summary, funding strategies, if we go the debt route, again, kind of what one cent on a tax rate could generate. Um, again, utility rates assumes a partial debt repayment. We'll have to do a new study after uh, FY29, so we continue um, with those rates. So we don't have the same issue that we've had a few years ago with the decline of fund balance. We can use fund balance. We can look at grants. Of course, we continue to look at that you know, loan option. Um, kind of a discussion point here to kind of wrap up our night. Um, how much excess fund balance are you comfortable with perhaps allocating to projects? We'll come back to that, but some other considerations we can uh, consider down the road. So we can um, look at allocating whatever net income we get at the end of the fiscal year once the books are audited. Let's just throw that into capital improvement projects. So there's at least some you know, uh, ongoing revenue um, sources for capital improvement. So whatever that, you know, that difference comes to be. Something to maybe consider down the road um, we can look at sales tax, actually. The state um, comptroller's office, you know, des designates, there's certain um, things that you can use sales tax for. Currently, we use sales tax for DCEDC. We do we have a portion that goes to the general fund, and we have a portion that goes towards property tax relief. You can only you designate up to 2%. That's our max, which we do designate 2%. But if you wanted to consider maybe reallocating where the some of that sales tax money goes, um, they do um, allow for street maintenance, so street uh, sidewalk improvements and um, reconstructions, not new streets, um, but that could be maybe a possible source to think about in the future to redirect some of that sales tax so there is a, a revenue stream that's not burdening the taxpayers for a street project. So just an idea to place out there. So I can just piggyback on the policy considerations and obviously not making, asking for any decisions tonight or anything. Um, and Richard and I have talked about this. I think Richard and my experiences are very, very similar. Like for instance, an unassigned fund balance policy would be a good thing that the city has the document and that's that whole thing like the 60 days, right? And what I can tell you in my experience, there was a minimum amount and an amount not to exceed. So that once you get over the amount, then it's like, okay, we actually have too much unassigned fund balance. Where are we gonna appropriate that, right? Or even uh, like a year end uh, fiscal policy, year end close where it's like, okay, we have, an extra million dollars in revenue versus expenses wouldn't be nice every year, but right. So instead of just continuing to add that into fund balance, do we go ahead and then allocate that to go to capital improvement project or something that we have upcoming instead of that rolling into unassigned fund balance? So those are all the policies, and, and I know Jennifer, you and I have talked about it too. That's some of the stuff we'll be bringing. So in your experience, in Richard's experience, is that <coughs> that excess Possibility is that a percentage or is it a raw dollar amount? It's usually a raw dollar, raw dollar amount. amount. Yeah, when you close the books. So okay. you know what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Let's um, kind of ending. If we want to end on this, I'm ready to even talk about this. You know, how much, you know, in terms of what I've already presented to you, what might you be comfortable with that we can might start bringing a plan back to you guys of, you know, using this much fund balance, if you will, to go towards some of these unfunded project needs, is there maybe an amount that y'all might be comfortable with saying, hey, $5 million or whatever the number is, you know, we're willing to use, you know, towards these needs. 
Well, and that might be part of, a, rather than trying to get that tonight, yes. that may be part of a good budget conversation, you know, because right now what we'll do is we'll take these things, especially the ones that the three groups listed for us, we'll include as much of that in the budget as we start to work through that, right? And then we may have to come to you with some different revenue solutions that include appropriating additional unassigned fund balance, right, to help keep the tax rate flat and those types of things, um, especially based on some of these expenses. But some of this is still very much in flux too, right? Like the $1.45 million for the field house, if they can really get the commitment from the DCEDC, then that's revenue coming in to cover that, right? And then we don't have to worry about that as part of the budget. So as we go through this process over the next, what, 60, 90 days, all the fun we're having. So. Remember, the field house debt payment is made in full out of the FY25, so that frees right up next year. what the... Yeah. Well, contributing to pay for the debt. So. We're in a much, much better situation with that. Equity's good. Mm -hmm. I accelerate that. Uh, they could probably pay it off early, but honestly, they are interested in uh, what I would say the economic engine that could be the field house, and so probably letting that just okay. kind of naturally run out so that they can invest in the facility to help expedite. The economic drive of the facility. You know, you know, they got nine million on the bottom line. Go ahead and get rid of that debt load now, too. Yeah. But yeah. I see the expediency of letting it ride yeah. and using all the cash I'm available for. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that there's some different ideas. We're talking about some stuff, even from a strategic <coughs> planning uh, for that facility, as well as possible additional investments. And obviously, we got to talk a lot more, but. There, there's all kinds of different things, but it's exciting. There's a lot of positive things happen, discussion that's happening in the field house. There are options. <laughs> to say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we already did the priority exercise, so we're not doing that again. <laughs> so, um, anything well, else you want to offer up at this point in time? Thank you for. What are we missing, though, based on stuff that you guys are passionate about or what you're hearing from your constituents or. Are there things that we've missed tonight? Is there something that you really would like to see that we didn't talk about or add tonight? No, but I do want to say I appreciate the work that y'all put in the funneling because I asked the question. So, well, you know, it sounds like we talked a lot about this last December, but yeah, the fact that you're taking, okay, way up here then, now we're getting a little bit closer uh, down here now. So, yeah, I appreciate y'all kind of facilitating us and getting us, giving us a put, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> pushing us in the right direction, so thank you. I think one thing we felt said that maybe we weren't as good at, so we weren't telling him what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. Let it rock around, rock around the table too long instead of saying, hey, Mr. City Manager, I think now you, I think something has been said tonight that you have some direction. Sure, absolutely. Jennifer. Yeah. It's a lot of information and it's really <laughs> can be uh, overwhelming. So, yeah, again, I will email you out the spreadsheet and you can play with it, filter it, whatever you want to do, because it's all calculated with subtotals and um, geeky, you know, spreadsheet. I, I am, so I'll send that out so you can, you know, have that electronically as well. So. Oh, well, it's just married. It's just your point, I guess. You are asking us anything that we left out, but I guess. Uh, I mean, do you feel like you have enough sufficient information, you got the feedback you expect from us in order for you to move forward? For now, but you're going to get a lot more from us because we're having a lot more in-depth meetings with the departments uh, through the budget process. So you'll get a lot more from us as we go forward because those meetings are long. <laughs> and we're asking Getting all kinds of questions. Getting into the weeds of every single pen and, and right. pencil. And yeah. Well, this wasn't weedy <laughs> enough. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to some Iranian now. Yeah. <laughs> well, even, next time darts, sir. Next time darts. Even <laughs> strategies. I mean, Richard and I just kind of share. Richard and I have very similar experience with even IT funding and some of those types of things. So we're we're gently trying to weave that into this yeah, budget absolutely. process and everything. So absolutely. Yeah. I think <clears throat> certainly from 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 my perspective uh, uh, on the finance side of it getting your input uh, to be able to uh, take back and collaborate with, uh, with Doug uh, is certainly very helpful as we continue to try to find the, the sweet spot, if you will. Recognizing that it's 
Doug has challenged all of us from the departmental standpoint to look at through things through a different lens for, uh, from a revenue perspective. Uh, we don't have the benefit of you know coming up with, uh, with a new product or a new a new good that's going to to to, to generate some of those uh, some of those revenue things that you know all local municipalities are typically challenged with, particularly us being in a in a landlocked uh, uh, scenario. So challenging us to look at things through a different lens, but really trying to find that sweet spot between uh, grant opportunities, additional revenue opportunities. Uh, uh, borrowing in terms of the debt and uh, and the fund balance and the fund balance is key because uh, we look at it now and say okay hey, we're in a pretty good position uh, but also again getting back to that revenue piece and the increasing expenditures we want to make sure on the finance side that we're being good stewards not only for the next two or three years but the next 10 15 20 years and so what does that look like and so you know certainly your input um, and our collaboration uh, from the finance side and certainly from uh, Doug's side and leading us as the city manager is going to be is going to be critical um, as we continue to try to plan this thing out not just in the five years but as Doug was saying that we can get to the 10 and 15 years um, and we can just <clears throat> you know continue to do our due diligence as as servant leaders and Richard if I can just piggyback on that council just so you know so every single one of these Jennifer's leading these budget meetings and Richard and I are in them I'm, I have to duck out sometimes but we're talking to the departments and reminding them these are taxpayer dollars right and we want to we want to ride the railroad train we don't want to ride the roller coaster in terms of taxes up and down and everything else and we want to try to minimize the impact of the taxpayers so if it's collaboration with other municipalities uh, whether it's reducing the expenses or additional revenue or if there's new alternative ways to think about things those are a lot of the conversations that we're having now because you can only police and fire especially those expenses are never really going to go down right but if we can look for additional sources of revenue to help that whether it's grants or some of the things those are a lot of the detailed conversations that we're having right now so that hopefully you get a, something that comes to you and this is all Pretty with a little bow on it that we all feel good about. So I think we wore everybody out where the pasta put everybody asleep. <laughs> 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 Thank you. It was too much. That's why you have it now. You have plenty of months. You have months to look at it now before we get into budget stuff. So. Oh, one thing just to answer to these concern about the uh, the railroad crossing. It was first briefed by the RTC about three years ago. Yeah, about two years ago. So I, it's not that they didn't know about it six years ago. It was never brought up to the RTC until about two years ago. It's been dormant for two years here. It's been worked on. I have emails that I'll send to Mr. Finch okay. uh, documenting done and not done. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Are we done? We're done. Matt, are you still willing to accept the position? I'm excited about it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm excited about it. Your probationary period runs out at nine o'clock. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like me, he was born and bred in Don Quixote. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> yeah. They, so, if, if we don't have any more um, to discuss about the bond projects, capital improvements, are we? Because I have another topic I would like to discuss under the general discussion. Under general discussion, in terms of the agenda itself, <laughs> that would be an acceptable item. <coughs> so, um, you said, um, say that one more time before I can make sure I'm in line. Yes, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the boards of commissions attended the planning and zoning meeting yesterday. And um, I know the joint session was council, but they were still <coughs> going to proceed with the meeting as they should with PNC. Um, it really important, <coughs> and we waited till about 715 to call the meeting. I want to know, uh, 
what are we doing as far as communications with the boards and commissions to confirm that we will meet quorum? Um, at what point do we decide we're going to call the meeting? Um, it's specifically for planning and zoning because those are items that will eventually have to come to us. And being that it was canceled last month and then canceled again this month, for me, it's a concern. Um, and how do we move forward with improving the participation? I know we've had this discussion before, um, and we probably feel like we're being a dead horse. But when it comes to planning and zoning, economic and development, just, well, DC, EDC, um, and amongst others, those are really high priority that um, some items are still being delayed, and now it's going on two months for some SUPs that were to be discussed. And we had about 20 something people in the audience who were ready to have their items um, discussed. So you have any advice hmm. or so, give us some direction uh, on what we can do as council to help. That's why actually at the last meeting, I think you and I had a conversation, right? Ms. Taylor did the presentation on kind of what's going on with the different vacancies. Um, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but the practice has been that the council traditionally has filled those vacancies in the fall. I think you, I highly would recommend you do that more often than once a year, first of all. Um, second of all, I think that you should really consider alternates for a variety of the boards and commissions because then that would help when there are people that um, are not able to make it for one reason or another. Um, in the case of the DCEDC, the DCEDC bylaws specifically call out the representation from the different sectors for that board. And I think we need to get back to that because that's their bylaws. Um, <clears throat> so like there's one vacancy right now and I haven't yet had a chance to talk to you about the different people who are on the board to see what sector is currently missing based on their bylaws. But I think that that's something that we need to uh, reevaluate. In the case of planning and zoning, I'll have to find out specifically for you. Um, one of the things that I would tell you is ongoing communication with the boards and commissions is really important. Um, I can tell you that once I started providing, I think I shared this with you just this weekend there, I start sending uh, the council out the AR on Fridays and then send a separate email every single Friday to the DCEDC sharing basically that same information so that I can keep the communication, especially while there's no economic development director that hat too, just so I can keep this communication going with them. And I know that they very much appreciate that and they feel much more engaged. And that's the thing is the last DC EDC meeting, every, all six of the current members were there in one form or another because they felt like they were engaged, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we really have to do with all the boards and commissions. I've had many conversations <coughs> with residents who are on other commissions that haven't met, they feel like it's disjointed, disconnected, they, have, they don't get any communication from the city. Um, some of the, some of the boards, or some of the commissions rather, um, there's hardly enough people on them to actually do a quorum, right? And I know that I've heard from several residents about, they think some of the commissions should really be either, whether or not they're combined or maybe they're held the same night and similar members are on the committee so that they can, so that they can meet. Like for instance, I'll tell you the one that's come up to me repeatedly is um, there's a number of residents, at least two or three, I shouldn't say, three, two or three residents that have said to me, they really feel like the members of the zoning, board of adjustment, and the sign board should be the same members on both and that they should meet back to back, maybe for the first half hour, 45 minutes or whatever it is, is the zoning board of adjustment, the second is the sign board because the similarities between the two of them are so closely aligned, right? And that way you could have the participation, you'd have the quorum, so you could have both boards meet and do whatever they need to do, even though they're two separate boards as stated in our ordinances. So, you know, we get creative and do some of those kinds of things. <clears throat> I don't think there's one solution other than I really think council should think about filling those vacancies more frequently than once a year. I think that would be a good way to start at least. Well, okay. there's been practice before um, when it comes to as far as ongoing monthly. Monthly. Yeah. yeah. As uh, constantly advertising when, when those come up and then um, specifically setting a timeline for when you're going to accept applications just like any other position and then making uh, either making a recommendation or letting the council interview. The other thing that I would say that I've, I've uh, experienced in the past is 
where the board or the commission that has the vacancy, where they've actually done the interviews and made a recommendation to the council in terms of who it is that they feel like should be appointed that would fit well with them. That way it's not taking up so much of your time. That's correct. And, and alternate. Right. I think alternate's a great idea, too. Hey, Greg, I Oh well, yeah, the Board of Adjustment always had nine members and five voting members during the meeting and four alternates. And uh, sometimes it was tough on the alternates because the first two years they really didn't participate. But there were always nine members. So I don't know what changed from back then to now. I don't think it's the city's fault. I don't think it's an individual's fault. <coughs> Something has just changed with the willingness for uh, the participants to be dependable. And uh, a point I want to make about this issue, because I heard about it too, uh, I would call, if I had a Tuesday meeting, and I think most of my meetings were on Tuesdays, um, but uh, if I had a Tuesday meeting, I would tell my board members, they all knew this, I'm going to start calling you the week before, and I want a confirmation back from you all, because coming into Friday, and especially Monday, I don't want to be sitting in a room with 20 people and not really knowing. Now, it's one thing if that that fourth person that you're waiting on, you know, they've got a flat tire or something else happened. That's one thing. But when, it, when, when they don't confirm, when they don't confirm at least the week before, I want to be there. Things can happen, but most often if they confirm, they'll be there. So it saves you the embarrassment for the city if you can get a process in place like that and, and convince the board members you're volunteering. Yeah, you can walk away anytime you want if you don't like the way we're putting this on you. But you got a responsibility. And I, as a liaison, has a responsibility to make sure I don't have 20 people in that room on, on Monday night and then have to cancel the meeting. So I, I'd recommend that if they're not doing that, that they do it and that there's a conversation with the board members about that responsibility to confirm especially on those boards that have habitual um, uh, no quorums. Um, I, I really think, I really would emphasize that until you get them fully staffed to uh, get the commitment from the board members that they will, because it's easy. I'm not, I'm not going to be there Monday for whatever reason. All right, I've only got three. I've got only got four members and I've only got three. I've got to cancel the meeting. Nobody likes that when you got to post that, but it's better than having 20 people show up and, and the other board members and everybody waste their time. When you just said something that <clears throat> also would have done in the past is that it is not just an automatic reappointment, right? It, you look at our attendance records and if people aren't showing up, they don't just get an automatic reappointment yeah. to the to the board, right? And so um, you know, that's something to consider. And it also seems like some of the folks that are on those commissions, maybe they've been there for quite some time and it's nice they can say they're on that, even if they don't actively participate, but they're not really held responsible if they don't. And so, you know, at some point, there's probably some difficult conversations that need to be had with some folks. Yeah. Uh, so, so far what I've heard that I do like is the board empowering them to have their interviews. Uh, I don't know how we feel about the council, but that seemed like they could fill the gaps a whole lot faster than what we're doing. Um, and then they bring to us the recommendations. They would make a recommendation, then you could interview the finalist or to whatever it is if you wanted to do that. And then ultimately it's a council decision. And taking action to make that. Um, yeah, so that was just concerning to me about people were expecting to have their items heard. It was about six SUPs on the agenda for the, that night. And is there any time frame that's attached or in conjunction with those items? Like, do they have to go back and reapply and then pay a, um, an additional permit fee? No, that's not so much with that, right? But the report that you're gonna see in May talks about the barriers to economic development and the growth of the city. That's one of them. <clears throat> and if we're going to get serious about doing some things, we need to make sure that we're responsive to the residents and business owners and developers, right? And so we laid out a 45, 60 plus, more or less, time period. And when they don't have a quorum, there's no way we're going to hit that. Right. Right. So that impacts us. It absolutely impacts us. 
Is there any way we can have, um, I don't recall it being in the AR, is there any way we can have a continuous communication about if they made a quorum? Because I didn't know a quorum was missed last month until I attended last night and heard about it. So are there any way we can keep updates on the boards and commissions? Let us look into it, but the challenge is, right, you don't necessarily always don't, get all the information. I don't get the information. All right. we do is post the agendas. <clears throat> And a lot of times, if they, unless they know that they're not going to meet quorum, they're going to keep it posted until the meeting starts. And then they, or if they realize it on Friday, they may cancel because they know they're not going to meet quorum. I but what, I would know ahead of time. I think what you're saying is when, when they don't meet for whatever reason, that the liaison would communicate that to you and you would communicate that to right. us. Yes, and what what we do is we do take attendance, and they should be taking attendance at every meeting. And when we send your packet, we include an attendance sheet for every current board member. We include their attendance. And I don't know, I believe there is an attendance policy for uh, boards and commissions, mm -hmm. and it's usually that you don't miss three consecutive meetings, mm -hmm. and then the council can request that you leave the board well do they not um do they not does the liaison not receive or have a a form that they bring into the meeting with them along with their other documents that has the start of the meeting then it has the list you check off everybody that's in attendance and anything that that goes on meeting after meeting there's a checkbox for everything on there that they should have and a place where they can keep notes, but the, including the voting. That should all be on a pre-printed pre document that they keep. It shouldn't all be handwritten longhand because it makes it much easier when they can just do that. And, and if they check all the boxes, you'll know who was there. You'll know who was there and it, they were excused. Um, well, it, go. It, it's, just, it's just a tool for keeping the board members accountable. Yes, you were good enough to volunteer, and you're not getting it paid for it. But the least you can do is is um, let us know if you're not going to be there, and if you're not there many times, you may not be reappointed, or you may be with removed. Mm -hmm. And even though we're short on these boards to begin with, um, you got to take some action if somebody keeps embarrassing you. Because to have and some of these applicants, and I've been there. Oddly enough, I wasn't there a lot. I had three boards, and I didn't have a lot of failure. It was just a different time. It wasn't me. It was just a different time. But you have people coming down from Plano to hear a case here. Yes. And, and then nobody sh and somebody doesn't show up. Um, there's no excuse for that. The city should know ahead of time so they can cancel that meeting and save those people that are coming from, one's coming from Waxhatchee, one's coming from Plano. That's inexcusable for a city to to have to sit there especially with one board that repeatedly does this, that needs to be fixed right away, in my opinion. I would agree. I would agree. So um, back to the question, if I'm a liaison, I know that last night was counseled. So is there, do they, do the liaison come to you the next day and say, hey, PNZ was counseled last night, you may want to inform me. No. Counsel. Because I just, I just realized that when you just said it, I, they never say anything to specifically to me to say that a board meeting was canceled. Is it realistic to ask? Um, sure, I mean, anything's realistic. I think to exactly what you were just talking about, I, with our new system, keep in mind, we're trying to transition away from paper, generally speaking. Um, so the InterGov system will do a lot of what you said electronically and give real lifetime updates, including they'll get the instant email notifications and all that instantly. So. That should help with some of this because they'll get all the stuff and the reminders and all that stuff. But I don't know, and I just made a note of a follow the project manager tomorrow, is whether or not there's an attendance thing as part of that. If there is, that's a simple solution because then that just becomes automatic email set up and then we can do that. But I have to check on that. I know when I was on Neighborhood Vitality, there was a, an attendance. Uh, policy expected. You know, if you miss, I think it was three or four. It's, it's usually three consecutive meetings. Then you were no longer able to participate. So, 
Because the internet I, I, system I think, even records votes. And stuff. Yeah, I think there, it, it distinguishes between an excused absence and mm -hmm. unexcused yes, absence. Yes, it does. Because the unexcused absence is the ones that'll kill you because you don't get the quorum. Yeah. And you've got those people coming down from wherever and everybody's sitting there in anticipation. It's just, it's bad business for the city not to try to catch it as soon as possible. And it's not too much to expect from the liaison that they do that. And if they're, if they're keeping those same records electronically, <clears throat> then you should be getting a copy of that so where you, you could see they don't even have to do anything the next morning you've got a copy of everything that went on Friday before they canceled the meeting for Monday you see that has been canceled because the liaisons and I know and I, how many in here have been liaisons you got your job to do and then you got this so your heart's not always in it because you it's tiring and like I said I have I mean, my whole career, I had my, my building official, as soon as I came on board, he went, Peter, handed me two of them and said, these are yours. I didn't know what I was doing. And I got Board of Adjustment Assigned Control Board, and I had that for 30 years. And I got economic development for a while. But I, I knew one thing. I knew I had to tell my boss if the meeting was canceled. And I knew how embarrassed I was if I didn't get a quorum. And I would be in my office 10 minutes after the meeting started. I'd be calling people. Any way you could make it. I know you said you couldn't, but can you get down here? Because they all live in Duncanville, right? Yeah, and and yes. some of them, sometimes they showed up. They weren't very pretty, but they showed up. <laughs> but, but, but I did everything I could, and I think, I, think, I think the people that are put in those positions would do the same thing if you set a policy and had a conversation with them about doing their part. They can't make these people come, but they could sure let people know ahead of time so these meetings could be canceled. Um, not everyone, but a lot more of them that are, that are, um, And then ask for, you know, advice from those that are successful. Parks and Recreation, they seem to be able to meet on a regular basis and not have continuous um, cancellations. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you're doing? What is it that um, the Arts Commission is doing right. that maybe we can take into consideration for the other boards and commissions? Um, it might be just a matter of motivation, but how do we encourage that motivation and something brought them in to apply for it? What is it that's keeping them from coming to keep their commitment to it? But that's just, that was my concern. And also a lady uh, was just disappointed that she came and she said, this is again, a council that's now pushed. This is going to be the, by the time it happens next month, it's going to be the third month and no one is calling for a special meeting. Um, so they don't realize what this does to me and my business. And that for me was, so. The, uh, the new system has a go live date of August uh, for the permitting system. And our new pro project manager is on top of it. So I'm totally confident it'll be August. And that'll help with some of these stuff these things, but it's not going to help with all of it, right? There still has to be a willingness and desire of the, uh, the person that's on the board of commission to actually participate. But it will help with the in communication because that'll be automatic stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. The conclusion of our business for tonight. Save discussion about the old fire station for another time. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I just I just want to make sure that. Okay, because we've got a lot going on, a lot of exciting things happening there in the new station, so I just want to make sure, make sure it doesn't get forgotten over there. Economic development? Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that is that what you had in mind? Something new? Well, I mean, we've got some kind of vague, yeah, ideas. I mean, right. and we, of course, we went and visited the station in Grand Prairie. I think we got some great ideas there, so I just... Yeah, I just want to make sure it doesn't get pushed too far back on the back burner. Well, I think of, because before it's, left the department, he told me that he actually has some developers interested in the building. There's, there's actually it's being, it's, at, it's, it's active there, in terms of what it's going to be repurposed as. There's what I understand number, for us. Yeah, there's a number of developers that are actually interested in it. At some yeah. point in time, there'll be some opportunities. But what I would also, David and I met with the Arts Commission today. They're very, very excited about that general area being an arts and cultural type of an area, mm -hmm. kind of away from some residential to do some different things and unique things. So I know that, I think is it later this month, the joint meeting with them? Yeah. Yes. And I know that they plan and tend to share that with you, that 
So that would, I think, also tie into the field station. And of course, Jeremy noted that my intention in taking council to the fire station at Grand Prairie was to demonstrate this is what can be done. This is a possibility. Don't demolish this building. It, it has great potential in terms of what can happen. That was my purpose in doing that one. <laughs> so before you wrap it up, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Okay. So, with the conclusion of our business for tonight, we are adjourning our meeting. The timestamp is 9 12. <laughs>